we will call this meeting to order. This is the February 16th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Welcome everyone. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow? Here. Houch? Here. McQueen? Here. Empfling? Here. Jerry Sims is uh, out, he is ill this evening. Also present is Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager Melissa Van Zant, Chief of Police Dave Hale, and sitting in from Coolidge Wall is Kofi Semenya. Thank you. Um, do we have any announcements? Yes, I have an announcement. Um, in regards to um, our <clears throat> proposed goal about restorative justice, um, there's a, a series of workshops being given at Antioch Midwest by uh, one of the, the leaders is Raymond Ruko, Jenny Coperthwaite's husband, who's a Maori elder, and uh, Wendy Peters, who is a native Hawaiian. And they're giving a series of workshops called the Trail of Understanding. Last Wednesday, they gave uh, a workshop on restorative justice. And this Wednesday, tomorrow, they're giving a second part uh, of that series on restorative justice called Assessing the Self. How do I embody fairness? So um, anyone, I think anyone who is interested in looking at indigenous people, um, uh, ways of doing justice, uh, and because most, or at least many indigenous people had uh, justice as a restorative kind of thing where it's restoring the community. Um, I would encourage them to go tomorrow at 7 o'clock at uh, Antioch Midwest. Okay. And can I just mention related to that that uh, Mr. Ruka also said that if council would like him to come and present about restorative justice as mm. we're working through that, he'd be happy to. Yeah, I, I thought to probably bring him to the, uh, the uh, getting my commissions mixed up, HRC first mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. talk about that is worth thinking about. Great. Okay, sounds good. Um, I have a few. Are you going to announce I'll do that? that one. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, I wanted to mention that I attended the uh, last school board meeting to uh, give information about the upcoming levy renewal that's on the March 15th ballot, and uh, council was thanked profusely for our participation in the PBL project and the students, you know, as, as we know, we're super excited, but I wanted to pass that along from the school board. It was also really great to see them talking about their execution of their strategic plan and, and I was very impressed. Um, I did want to highlight the Arts Council member show that we are sponsoring as council. The People's Choice Award is happening this Friday from six to nine at one uh, at Quarry Street. And um, also, uh, if you haven't seen, um, this weekend is a focus on building, efficiency building with community solutions and the resilience network. And I thought it was worth highlighting that uh, on Saturday at 1 p.m., there's gonna be a, a very innovative, they're calling it eight by eight, eight presentations about uh, efficiency and, and building uh, at eight minutes each. Um, and then on Saturday, New Urban Cowboy is being shown for free at the Little Art. And there's a really great program at 3 p.m. at the library about home energy savings. And these are things that anybody can do on their own. Um, since we were talking about community solutions, I, I also wanted to mention their March 3rd open house at their new offices uh, on Antioch College campus. And I thought finally it was worth mentioning, we got a last minute uh, correspondence from Jessica Thomas and uh, she was thanking the HRC for helping to bring host speaker James Box from Amera, Amera I Can program. And um, she just wanted to, you know, highlight that it was a really uh, successful event with great communication. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, next Wednesday, February 24th at 7, is a staff recognition, promotion, and swearing-in ceremony at uh, over at Miami Township Fire and Rescue. And I know one thing that they are extremely happy and proud of is that I believe two of the three new officers are Antioch College students. And this is their first in how many years, Denny? Uh, so, 
So very, very good. We're also, there's also going to be a promotion, and Steve McFarland will be retiring after 17 years. So I believe the community is invited to that. Okay. Um, and uh, the chamber is having our annual meeting uh, this coming Thursday. Um, if anybody is interested, it's out at Antioch University Midwest. Um, I think that's it. Let's see what's um, moving on to the consent agenda. It's a pretty big one this time. We have the minutes of the February 1st meeting, uh, the financials for January from our finance director, uh, the quarterly treasurer's report, uh, resolution 2016-08 designating Judy Kittner as village council's designee to receive public records training on behalf of each of the elected officials pursuant to and in accordance with the Ohio Revised Code section 109.43B and 1049.43E1 and also resolution 2016-09 authorizing the sale during calendar year 2016 of municipally owned personal property which is not needed for public use or which is obsolete or unfit for the use for which it was acquired by internet auction pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 721.15D. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next is a review of the agenda. Is there um, anything we uh, we want to add or uh, delete from this agenda? We will need to add an executive, executive session, session to the end for to discuss uh, lit litigation. I have a request regarding timing of the Environmental Commission report. Um, Jessica D'Ambrosio, who's here, uh, is going to give the report, and she lives in Columbus, which means she's going to have to drive home tonight. So, this, the more uh, can we put her? We'll just put her first um, on the list. I mean, it's, of it's the coming report. up. Yeah. Well, okay. the council goals though could take a while. Um, do we want to move all of the special reports up in front of the legislation? I, I would be willing to do that because yeah. I think that that legislation that could nice. actually be That would be a extensive. friendly thing to do. Okay. okay. Um, we, uh, I would also like to add talking about the uh, Village Facebook page. To old business. Yes. And are we going to talk about um, the request from Antioch College tonight? Uh, I thought we could. Um, well, we didn't. It's under, we it's, haven't reviewed petitions and communications. Let's just do it during petitions and communications. Although, let's let's add it. Let's add it to new business. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else? Um, Brian, would you, um, are you ready to review? I the, am. Um, so we got a very cute uh, <laughs> note from Matteo Basora, who, uh, Thanked. This was which officer? Okay, for uh, being an everyday hero and saving his dog. Um, we also, uh, well, uh, Reggie Stratton's letter. I think we'll we'll talk about when we get to new business. Uh, we got the mayor's monthly report. It looked a lot like last year in terms of um, the statistics. Uh, very interesting program happening happening at the Air Force Museum Theater uh, in commemoration of the Tuskegee Tuskegee Tuskegee, Tuskegee. okay Airmen. Uh, this was the first African American uh, Corps of Pilots, and this is part of their eight-part Living History series. Um, that information. Well, it's happening on February twentieth. Um, Bob and Sue Parker. Uh, talked about how much they love Channel 5 and uh, when it was down last week they felt disconnected because this is a lifeline for them um, and they talked about how much better things look and uh, the sound was good and they loved the photos and so there you go Susan say good job um, Energy Smart, uh, we had a letter about the appliance recycling program. E efficiency Smart. Did, what did I say? Energy? energy I'm sorry. Energy. Efficiency Smart. Thank oh, you. That's my, my error. Sorry. Yep. And uh, uh, NAMI is having or is hosting an uh, investment workshop. And I think what's interesting about this is 
It's particularly designed to try to avoid fraud uh, and smart investing. That's happening uh, this Thursday, February 18th at 7 p.m. It's in Springfield. Uh, we had the notice about the public participation from the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. They are asking for uh, input on their open space plan. That's going to be February 25th at 4. I think I covered them all. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to special reports, and we'll just go ahead and go alphabetically. So, well, at least we'll start alphabetically. We will start with Environmental Commission, so our Columbus uh, person can um, hit the road. Uh, I'm going to read from my computer. That's where all the notes are. Uh, hello, Council. It's nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so the Environmental Commission. I serve on the Environmental Commission and I uh, will serve on the commission uh, through 2016. Uh, we had a couple of initiatives that we worked on uh, during last year. One was an alternative to pesticide use in the village. And as a response to uh, pesticide misapplication uh, around the uh, Gaunt Park pool, we decided we would look into the issue of how we can uh, stop using pesticides in our maintenance um, facilities. And so in the spring of 2015, uh, we began working with Beyond Pesticides, which is a national nonprofit organization um, that looks at a model of organic land management policy and looked at incorporating that into a policy for the village. Um, in the spring, we, also, we had a presentation to the village crew, a facilities crew and parks crew, and gave them an overview of the impact of the toxic chemicals, the impact and why it's important to look into organic chemical use and pesticide use. Um, and we are ongoing in 2016 to try to set up a training and a presentation and education for residents to raise local awareness about pesticide use and organic lawn management. Uh, we were interested in the glass farm wetlands, glass farm property, and in the, um, the, uh, the beavers moving in. and and all, all the excitement that created over the last year. Uh, we did write a grant at the beginning of last year to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that the council at that time decided we would not put forward. Uh, we did um, do a little more research and a little more investigation into the property at the request of council. And we were able to, working with Tecumseh Land Trust, we were able to successfully submit a Clean Ohio grant uh, we found out of that award um, at the end of 2015. And what that will do is it will establish a conservation easement on approximately eight acres of the easternmost part of the glass, or the glass farm. Uh, we will um, create an access road and some community gardens. We will remove invasive plant species and plant natives there. Um, those natives will include trees, prairies, and wetland plants. And we will also include a small parking area with some benches for recreation for local residents. Um, that's an ongoing project, and we hope to have a lot of volunteer support, village support, and um, uh, bring everyone to the area and educate them not just about the beavers, but also the importance of the glass farm property and recreation area. Um, we have uh, worked with the Resilience Network and the climate action planning that's been going on in the village. Um, uh, we began, one of our members began using the uh, greenhouse gas um, um, inventory, ICLEES inventory. We brought that to council and it was approved that we can, we can begin with that inventory. We are working with the energy board also to do that. Um, so we had a climate action planning kickoff meeting, uh, which was attended by 30 villagers. We defined the emission scope we'll include in our inventory and we are making progress with the inventory now. So that is an ongoing process. Um, and we hope to complete the inventory within three months, but it's sometimes the data is very hard to get, so it really depends on how good the data is that we can get and how fast we can obtain it. But we're hoping that within three months we can have the inventory um, and start to, once we have our baseline, we can then start reducing emissions in the village. Um, lastly, we looked at uh, protecting our wellhead and our source water drinking for the village, uh, very important. Um, so we uh, started to take a look at that um, in the middle of last year and reached out to Ohio EPA's Source Water Protection Program. We were unable to meet with them during last year, but we were able to, as a result of some back and forth communication, we were able to update and approve our emergency contingency plan for the village, which is very important. 
just recently, <coughs> within the last week, we were able to meet with EPA again, and we are moving forward with the wellhead protection planning and updating that plan. So look forward to that in the upcoming year, and we hope to have that plan uh, updated um, by June, or at least by mid-year of 2016. Uh, and hopefully we'll have that done before the um, treatment plant comes online or the plans are finished for that. And that's, that's all. Thanks, Jessica. Any questions for Jessica or comments? Uh, I was wondering about the ICLEI tools. Um, so, so you mentioned the template for the inventory. What are some of the other tools that we're going to be able to use for climate action planning? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and let me see. I have some notes here. I know we want to... Um, we, we have a milestone to, to within two to four months of completing the plan to establish reduction targets. I don't know that I could tell you exactly what, what model we'll use to do that. Um, I, we also want to um, implement some policies and measures after the two-year mark to kind of ensure that we are keeping those reductions on target and on pace. Um, again, I'm not sure what specific models we will use for that. I think that will be part of our discussion. And then we want to be able to monitor and verify our results, which will be an ongoing process. So I think ICLEI will help guide us in that. And in all those phases. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. This is definitely a long-term process and plan. Good. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great, great work. Report. Thank Thanks. you, Jessica. Thanks. Thank you. So Thanks. we'll get back in order. We'll go back to uh, the Library Commission. I see Carl Cologne in the back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. I'm Carl Cologne, uh, director of the Greene County Public Library, um, and uh, it's my honor to participate in the Library Commission. As Council is aware, the Library Commission was established by the Council to advise Council, literally just advise Council, on uh, the use of the library building, which the village has very generously provided for 50 years now uh, in our current building. It was a very exciting mm. year in 2015. We had the 50th anniversary of the Yellow Springs facility. Uh, the village was uh, extraordinarily generous and, uh, and saw to it that there was a new roof on that facility. I cannot thank the village enough. I cannot thank Patty enough for her participation in what may safely be described as an epic roofing project. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of neat things happened. Uh, in addition, uh, to the 50th anniversary, uh, we started uh, with a pro in, a, in a partnership with the Little Art Theater. I'm looking forward to the library's work uh, within the community. This coming year, we're very excited that the Yellow Springs Community Library has been chosen to be the site of an Ohio historic marker commemorating the life and contribution to literature of Yellow Springs' own Virginia Hamilton. Uh, this is a splendid project that's being done uh, through a series of partnerships. Village of Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs uh, Community Library, Green County Public Library, Arnold Adolph, and then uh, the Dayton Regional STEM School. So we're very excited about that. Uh, any, uh, any true librarian knows what uh, Virginia Hamilton has contributed to the world of letters. There are international awards named after her, and rightly so, and I'm just frankly thrilled that we'll be appropriately commemorating her uh, at a library, which of course has rooms that bear her name as well as her portrait. Uh, I, know, I know commissions are supposed to produce numbers, so I'll bring a few to you here. Um, in 2015, the Yellow Springs Community Library had 6,155 cardholders, up 7% from the previous year. You do the math, that means a lot of people have two cards in the village. We're very happy about that. <laughs> um, the total visits were 114,492, up about 1.5% from last year. Uh, total program attendance, and I have to say this is probably my favorite number each year. Uh, was 5,207 folks, up 47%. We're on a programming tear. As the community is well aware, uh, you were extraordinarily generous to the library uh, in our 2014 levy effort. Um, we promised to do what you told us with the money that you entrusted to us. Our surveys show that you want more programming and more stuff. And folks, we're delivering and you're coming and we appreciate that. Uh, total circulation at the library was 175,505. Though I should mention, because of the way uh, we get our download statistics, that doesn't include all the many items that were downloaded by folks within the village. So the actual, uh, that very, very high circulation number is actually quite a bit higher when you include all the things that have been downloaded. Um, we're excited this year. Um, we're looking forward to, um, I think, smaller work. 
than the giant roof on the Library Commission this year, uh, looking after little things, working in cooperation with the Yellow Springs Library Association, which will be funding some projects related to the building. And that's really all I have to say, except one more time, thank you very much. We're only able to do what we can do for Greene County through the libraries through the support of our municipalities that provide the buildings, that, that provide the literal roof over our heads and the ground under our feet that makes this service possible. Mm -hmm. With that, I'd be delighted to entertain any questions. I, I just have one <coughs> comment um, about the Virginia Hamilton marker. Yes. Um, while I would like to take credit for it, I actually <laughs> have to say it was Karen who was instrumental in getting that marker placed there. Mm -hmm. So I very much appreciate it. Yeah, I, I had the uh, pleasure of working uh, with Ms. Wintrow very closely on that project mm -hmm. and uh, we, we looked at a number of sites within the village and uh, and again as I mentioned Mr. Adolph couldn't have been more generous with his time and consideration and uh, again considering Virginia Hamilton statue in the world of literature uh, that he was so thrilled that we were interested was just uh, delightful but almost mystifying you know we we're like come on it's Virginia Hamilton <laughs> <laughs> And there will be a ceremony. Um, we're looking at April or May, is that? We're trying to figure that, yeah, we're still mm -hmm. working but, on dates, but we're trying to talk about something in the spring. And it will be a public, uh, obviously the public will be invited and everybody will know, so it will, yeah. it will be a, a big celebration. Could you s just say a few words about um, the um, Imagination Library? I would be delighted. Um, as council is aware, um, since two November 2013 <coughs> now, the Greene County Public Library uh, in the conjunction with the Greene County Public Library Foundation, the United Way of the Greater Dayton Area, Sewing Medical Center, uh, Rotary Clubs, and uh, Yellow Springs Library Association, many other groups, um, has supported a work called the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Uh, this works in the field of pre-literacy. Um, what we discover is, is that there is a whole set of skills that children have to know before they can be taught to read. The stuff that's so simple you don't even think of it as skills. What's a letter? What's a number? Or if you happen to be my children, that you read books and don't eat them. Um, <coughs> these critical skills actually ideally need to be learned by age three and certainly by age five. Um, a series of studies from everyone from Emory University to Reading is Fundamental shows that book ownership, remember we're the library, we're the get books out and get books back, but we're talking about book ownership by children is one of the critical drivers to acquisition of literacy skills. Well, we found out that the Dolly Parton Foundation down uh, out of uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, had had a project running for almost 20 years where they managed to lower the price on getting a book to a child to uh, $2.08 a month, and they did it annually for about a cost of 25 bucks. As your county librarian, I can promise you, you cannot stamp and mail a book for $2.08, much less buy it, stamp it, stuff it, ship it. Um, the reason it's so cheap through the Dolly Parton Foundation is, is that she has established a number of businesses, uh, including her famous dinner theater down there, the profits of which are paid directly into her foundation to reduce costs so that communities like ours can raise uh, the money to offer the opportunity for every child uh, below the age of five in our county to be getting a book a month. Uh, ideally from birth. If you do it from birth, then, then that's 60 books by the time they turn five. The books are amazing. These are Caldecott level books. They're chosen by a committee of librarians and teachers. Um, and the good news in Greene County is, is that uh, when, since we started in uh, 2013, November, we thought we would have a quiet opening. That was wrong. Um, we've delivered over 85,000 books to children under the age of five in Greene County. We'll hit 100,000 books uh, right around June. And um, we're, we're hoping to move the needle because um, we have a little motto with this project that we came up with, which is uh, kids who read succeed. And our fear is, is that kids who don't, don't. And so we felt that it was appropriate for the public library to be out there in front leading the charge with uh, our youngest children, whom we see in the library all the time for story times. And uh, we're excited about this project and uh, for what it can do for the kids in Greene County. Also want to tip my hat to the Educational Services Center right here in Yellow Springs who are helping us work with all the different school districts to make this program as widespread as possible. Thanks, Carl. 
Thank you. Carl, actually, I wanted to, I know, you know, over the past several years, there have been a lot of renovations to help with energy saving. Yes. And I'm curious, has that had an influence on other libraries in Greene County? Well, that, that's a very good question. It's worth understanding a little bit, eh, sorry to get all arcane about this, it's worth understanding the structure of the libraries in Greene County. We're um, blessed with the fact that we have but one library system in Greene County. In Montgomery County, for example, they have four separate library systems, and there's counties up north where they have seven separate library systems or more within a county. So, yes, it has had an influence, but to be honest, it's, it's, it's because I've helped that spread that influence. Um, and we've, in turn, tried to make some changes that we thought were helpful. We engaged in a contract with Energy Optimizers, uh, who we had worked with in a number of, uh, who we have partners who have worked with them in a number of places, and we replaced all the lights in our buildings this year, including the Yellow Springs Community Library with LED lighting. Um, so we're burning a whole lot less coal to keep those lights on, which is something we're very pleased about. I was told that the savings is approximately 40 to 50 percent over a fluorescent light and more than 90 percent over an incandescent light, although we haven't had incandescent lights in the libraries, at least during my time here. <laughs> so we're excited about that. Um, simple changes like this make a huge difference in uh, bending the curve uh, on emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it lowers the costs for the taxpayers of Greene County, so it's a win-win. So have you been seeing lo lower um, energy costs? That's an excellent question. The lights went in in December, so well, we're just... Well, but with the heating, with the change that was made a couple of years ago to the heating system, the windows, some of the windows that were added. Let me check with Mel Brindley. Um, and he can give you the best information on that. And I just want to say thanks uh, to the Yellow Springs Library staff <laughs> for being just so accommodating about the space use. I mean, so many meetings happen there, and it's, it's great. We so. have a wonderful staff, and they're reflective of the wonderful community they serve. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Human Relations Commission. Can you get it, Nick? No, I can't reach it. <laughs> <laughs> you just grab it right out of there. Oh, yeah. I think he's yeah. just going to. Yeah, it's perfect, right there. Um, Hi, I'm Nick Cunningham. I'm the uh, chairperson of the HRC. Uh, first off, I would just like to throw a little ad lib. Um, this year, um, personally for me, uh, I've been dealing with a uh, new disability. I actually have a name right now. I've been diagnosed with uh, moderate to severe short-term memory loss caused by uh, traumatic brain injuries. Mm -hmm. That just means I've had over 13 concussions. And it's through the help of my Commission staff over here. I've got uh, Steve McQueen, Secretary, Kate Hamilton, my Vice Chair, and uh, Christy Cruz, my um, Treasurer, and they've been able to help me help the group to succeed and get everything done that we've been able to do. So I'd just like to thank them while they're sitting here. So that's kind of nice. Um, so on with the report. Um, in 2015, with our budget of $8,500, we were able to um, work with and uh, do um, approximately uh, 20 different projects throughout the year, um, ranging from meets and greets when we had one so people could actually come out and meet the HRC Commission, which was a first, I think, um, to um, when Chief Hale came in and we had the uh, meet and greet with him so the village could come out and meet him. And uh, we did some conflict resolution trainings. Um, so. Um, uh, the police officers could learn how to uh, mediate situations a little easier and better than what they, other people might consider uh, a more aggressive way. Um, and then there's other things like when we had the uh, uh, international fellows come and visit, we took them to the state house and we brought them around and that was kind of interesting. Um, and then of course, you know, the popular thing in town that we all do is the uh, Yellow Springs block parties. We were able to um, help out with that. and. Um, over the years, it's becoming more and more popular. That, um, I think now we're up to twice as many as we had the year before. So yeah, it's getting popular. Like more and more neighborhoods are uh, joining up, and they're like, "Oh, we want to have one, and we want to have one." So everybody's like um, finding out what to do, and then to get to know their neighbors. So it's kind of a, a, a nice project that we help out with. And then there was um, uh, we've helped out with um, the. Uh, um, 
excuse me, <laughs> the Yellow Springs uh, Kids Playhouse. We helped them. It was a project that uh, I kind of got really interested in, speaking of memory, because uh, um, they did a play where they helped with uh, autistic kids. And one of the things we helped with was to get these things called fidgets. And they help autistic kids calm themselves down. It's kind of strange, because in my house, I got one. And every time I see it, it reminds me of what we did out there. So and then when people see me playing with it at home, they're like, what is that? And it's just for me, it's a reminder. Oh, that's for these autistic kids here. It helps them do this, which was one of the things we wanted to do, was have something that people could pass around and spread the word, not just, you know, so it was, wasn't something that would alienate the kids, that only the kids with autism had it, so everybody could have one and spread it around. So it was kind of a cool project on that end. Um, We've also worked on uh, uh, self-defense groups for, um, with the, uh, uh, well, excuse me if I got the name for a sec, uh, the uh, Ninja Self-Defense and Women's Empowerment Groups. So um, uh, that was, um, was, was that also with the Boys and Girls Night Out, the girls part? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, because we uh, worked with the Boys and Girls Nights Out, and with the Girls Night Out, we worked with the uh, Ninja uh, Workshop so that they could learn some self-defense. and. And the same with the boys, they, you know, working with their no means no situations, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and also, um, we helped with the eighth grade uh, senior trip again. We were able to um, help them out in a scholarship type way, so those that couldn't um, come up with the full amount right off the bat, we were able to scholarship it out, so each, we were able to help certain amounts of kids on that one. Um, we do have some, um, projects that are still ongoing, uh, like um, with the NAMI, Green County, Clark, Madison counties, wanted to make sure I said all of them. Uh, we continue to help them uh, provide support with uh, for families uh, suffering from mental illness. And um, in July, we started up another group with uh, the Village Assistance Network, yeah, uh, VAN for short. And it's for um, local families that uh, um, fall into a financial needs or sometimes we're working on different things. So to help people out that might not have a backup situation, so it's just something else that the village can help out with. And another thing that we helped out was with the uh, Boy Scouts Troop Equity Project, which my son, who's a senior scout, uh, they were all part of it. And for them, it was like, why isn't everybody this way? So for them, it was just something we did. And they were proud of it. They, you know, it's like, oh, good, another color on our flag. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that was a good one on that one. And then, uh, for, uh, 2016, we do have some uh, upcoming projects. We are um, uh, working on the launching of the uh, YellowSpringsHelp.org, which is a uh, um, website where you can go to and find help from different organizations for people that might need different things. Um, the Know Your Neighbor program, uh, basically, uh, so people will um, say if there's a crisis in town, like a power out or a storm or something, just a, a, um, a situation where you could um, have somebody go check on the neighbors, so it's not just somebody random coming up to a door and knocking on the door. It would be somebody they know that's approaching in case you have somebody with like a mental illness or disabilities, so they might not, you know, they might not shovel their driveway, so if you see them in the snow, you know, it's a program to help them out. Also, uh, the Chronic Pain Support Group is uh, something I've found since I moved to town. There are a lot of people in town that have um, pain issues, and they're all in little closet pockets, and I want to try and get everybody together and start an open discussion and get people talking with each other. Um, could also fall into the diversity discussion and, and reading groups. Um, and also with the drug, uh, community drug issue discussion. So we are working on different issues for uh, uh, opening up discussion with, with uh, town people. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank here. Yeah. That's one of those problems I have when I get anxious, my brain shuts off. Um, <laughs> do you guys have anything to add? Or are we open for up for questions? Do you guys have any questions? Do you have a process for, um, who, for evaluating how you evaluate and determine um, the grant recipients um, that's, that's documented and that you can um, show the thought process that went into it? Right now, but we're going to be working on that at our, our retreat in March. Um, Linda Rudowski, who was on the commission previously, um, sent us a chart that they kind of used because that's a puzzle that we have at HRC regularly is 
does this fit our mission? How does it fit our mission? Sometimes we really wrestle with that. So that's one of the things we are going to be working on at our retreat in March 6th, is getting some firmer guidelines on, on just that process. I'm wondering if the format that, that council has for requests, financial requests, might be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... Could, I could... Uh, I mean, it, that could, could be something you could share with them. Yeah, but I, I would, I think, I think something, just to have something documented. We do um, wrestle with that. It's, it's probably one of the main things we, we have to discuss at the meetings is, does this fit our mission? How? Yeah, and then it comes into question, like, what can we, like, when you have an issue, like, we can't pay somebody to do some of thing, but we can, like, sponsor in people to do something. Like, we can't pay directly. So, and then it came down to we're not sure what exactly. So it is something that is going to be brought up at a retreat. We're trying to come up with a set guidelines. I would like to say though that I've been very I've been a, the liaison for I guess maybe the last half year. That I've been very impressed with the diligence that the commission members exhibit in terms of. Uh, examining does this project fit the mission in questioning the person who's coming regarding the grant um, to get more information um, and also in giving tips on how to write a better grant or how to get the information out or really sort of examining what the program is so that that's been very I, I have been very impressed about that and I mean the kind of grants and the different kind of activities that HRC uh, does is sort of all over the place, but I mean, human relations covers a lot of <laughs> different stuff. How much, how much of the uh, 2015 budget did you guys spend? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we spent the whole thing, and as a matter of fact, I think we went $40 over. Okay. I was looking at the budget reports this afternoon. I'm pretty sure we went $40 what is the budget? $8,500. It was 10000 but last year, uh, every department was asked to cut, and we got cut 1500 so. Actually, I thought we you had, had a little money left. I also had a request from John Gudgel last year for the school programs. Um, I'm not certain what was going on with that, but there were fewer requests from um, the school for grants this year. and. Mr. Gudgel said it probably won't be that way this year. Again, I don't know what happened there. Yeah. What were you saying, Patty? I, I thought I remembered that they had some money left last year, and I was just looking for the end of the year financials on my flash drive here, but I, I thought they had a little bit left last year, but I could be wrong. You mean 2015? Right. Yeah, I, I did as well. Can, can somebody um, ex talk about the Yellow Springs Help um, website and what the plans are for HRC's interface and interaction with that? It's really in process. There, there have been no decisions. So is it, it's not something that's, it's not an imminent decision? No. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good work. And finally, we have a presentation by Springnet's, SpringsNet on fiber optic network for Yellow Springs. Sure, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Good evening, members of council. Um, SpringsNet, as uh, I think most of you know, is an ad hoc volunteer citizens group. Our goal is taken directly from the council's goal 
to develop and implement a plan to build a municipally owned fiber optic network that will support all Yellow Springs citizens and encourage economic development. For almost the past year, um, members of SpringsNet have been uh, hard at work studying the issues, uh, researching details of possible solutions, talking with officials from other communities across the country, and um, uh, meeting approximately twice a month to just process our work. My name's Scott Fife, and I uh, won the coin toss, so I get to be the one that brings the results to you tonight. Uh, I am actually very pleased to be here on behalf of SpringsNet to present to you our findings, uh, a suggested solution, and, along with a funding plan, uh, which I hope you'll like, and to lay out the next steps for making this goal a reality, should you wish to do that, and we hope you will. This is by necessity a very high level summary of the work that we've done, uh, which is of course more accurately detailed in the 22 page white paper that I believe you've all received. And I will refer to that several times tonight. In addition, all of the financial uh, scenarios, calculations and methods that were used in that white paper uh, and are included in these slides reside in a very detailed spreadsheet which we'll be happy to share with you at some point in the future when, we, when, you, when you're uh, inclined to, to see those kinds of details. Much too much for tonight. The connection between economic development and infrastructure is really pretty undeniable. Um, businesses of all types and sizes are requiring ever more bandwidth as applications like telepresence, which we used to call video conferencing, become commonplace. Census data from the year 2010 indicate that 10.6% of the overall village workforce, which is approximately 195 citizens, were home-based workers. That is a 35% increase from the year 2000. In the fields of engineering, science, and computer-based occupations, however, the number of home-based workers in Yellow Springs was up 69% over that same period. And this trend is expected to continue. In summary, telecommunications capacity is no longer a luxury or a nice thing to have. It really has become an essential condition for business, just like electricity or water. The village telecommunications infrastructure is predominantly made of copper wire from the first half of the 20th century or coaxial cable from the second half, almost all of which predates the internet and virtually all of which was built by private companies motivated by profit. While advances in technology have led to skyrocketing demand for bandwidth, the relatively static area and population of the village naturally limits the demand. And with that, it limits the incentive for AT&T and Time Warner to modernize this infrastructure. Meanwhile, the number of internet connected devices, which is currently estimated to be about 5.7 per household, is expected to double by the year 2020. Now, all of this supports the idea that today's telecommunications infrastructure is both an individual and a community need, which is worthy of a community utility to supply it. The recent survey that was conducted by SpringsNet, and this is detailed on your white paper on page 16, showed significant dissatisfaction with the overall value of current telecommunications service and with each subcategory, which included the speed, the reliability, the quality, and the customer service from both of the existing providers. It also indicated that there was substantial community support for a publicly owned alternative. <clears throat> this is the exciting graph right here. Uh, this graphic illustrates the bandwidth capacities, the relative bandwidth capacities of common communications networks, starting with dial up and moving up to fiber optic. Now, beyond the obvious capacity difference, a fiber optic network offers a number of additional advantages, including it's extremely reliable, it carries no electricity, it's not vulnerable to lightning or water, has no static, and is not subject to corrosion or cracking. Uh, it's actually, actually more environmentally friendly than copper 
uh, and metal-based uh, communications media. Uh, it is, as technology evolves, fiber optic networks are upgradable by replacing the electronics. So the fiber stays in place, you get new electronics on the end, you get faster, better networks. And therefore, it would be state of the art for decades to come. This map shows that um, while many municipalities have some fiber optic resources, uh, there are actually 83 communities in the United States that have built publicly owned fiber optic networks that reach most or all of their citizens and businesses. Um, of these 83, only 50 of them offer service with a speed of one gigabit or faster. SpringsNet is proposing to you that Yellow Springs become the first gigabit fiber to the premises community in Ohio. Could, could we ask questions? Absolutely. Well, well I have two. What are the fi what what material is the make is used to make the fiber optic glass? Oh, wow! It's light passing through glass. <laughs> wow! But it it must have some flexibility. It does. It's very very thin glass. The, the, the other question I had is I was looking at the map. It looks like Virginia Virginia or Kentucky or somewhere it seems to have a whole lot of communities. What happened there? That well, I, I, I would defer that question to, to my colleague Tim Barhorse. He did most of the, the research on this. Um, I, I don't know if I have an answer to that question. I would just think that certain states and certain localities have been a little more proactive depending on the technology of various businesses in those areas uh, and mm. the municipalities involved. It's impressive. Well, it is. We would be the first in the state. <laughs> we would. Um, so we're, we're proposing that, that Yellow Springs become the first gigabit fiber to the premises, which means every address in the village, every business, every home. Um, pause three seconds to let this thing in, sink in. Okay, this, this table, if you look at the blue rows, blue shaded rows in this table, uh, they demonstrate current levels of service and the average national cost for telecommunications by the two major providers, that would be Time Warner and AT&T in Yellow Springs. Um, now, please compare these with the estimated levels of service and the suggested pricing for a community-owned fiber optic network, which are shown in orange. And again, our methodology and the assumptions for our suggested pricing are all detailed in the white paper and we'll be more than happy to discuss those at length with you, um, but not tonight. Uh, the bottom line is that we could expect exponentially faster speed and better quality at a fraction of the current price. Uh, this proposal would benefit the entire community, it would pay for itself, and it would keep costs affordable for everyone. Now, time does not permit drilling into the numbers in this chart tonight, uh, but we wanted to share our very conservative estimates with you for year one expenditures. Uh, we chose year one because that would include all of the construction, all of the equipment, and uh, the initial operation costs at a total that we think will really surpri surprise many people. Um, we've worked through a number of corresponding revenue models uh, and almost any way you slice it, the numbers work. Um, we are very excited to share those models with you again in a working session, which we, we hope to have. Finally, the, the last graph here I've got tonight uh, illustrates a uh, projected fund balance uh, using our proposal, um, again, with the assumptions that we've made, uh, and three different di subscription rates which are also, it's also referred to as the take rate. So we've, we're showing you 40, 50, and 60% subscription rates in the community. Now, for background, out of the 83 municipal networks we just talked about, um, the average of those 83 is 55% subscription rate. So we believe ours is, is very conservative, and uh, our survey suggests that we could expect an even higher percentage than that. Um, this demonstrates that our proposal pays for itself in 20 years or less, even under very pessimistic subscription levels. And again, we're, we're very anxious to share all these details with you. Um, 
we know that's not appropriate tonight. There are a number of reasons why we think this is really a great idea. Um, and this slide highlights a number of the, the more important ones. We think it's consistent not only with the village history and our sense of community, but it also acknowledges that telecommunications is a vital public utility. Um, while our small area and our static population make it less likely that AT&T and Time Warner will uh, provide solutions to our telecommunications woes, um, those same factors actually work in our advantage if we were to try and build a network ourselves. Uh, the village is discreet. It's uh, not subject to a lot of sprawl. That makes planning much simpler, and um, we think that's a big positive. Um, Yellow Springs owns the poles. They own the trucks. They own the right. They they have the right of ways worked out. Um, they have a mechanism for billing. Those are all huge factors when it comes to implementing something like this that would put us far ahead of of other communities. And. Um, also, we have Maveca, a not-for-profit, not sorry, a not-for-profit public agency, which maintains a wealth of public resources, including expertise, experience, and especially high-volume purchasing power for internet bandwidth. Um, many people don't know this, but Maveca already provides internet connectivity to local governments, higher education. Uh, nonprofit organizations and more than 65,000 K-12 students in an eight-county region, right here in Yellow Springs. Um, SpringsNet proposal takes advantage of this important resource. Also, potential small business opportunities abound in this in the implementation and ongoing support of this project. Um, Village ownership of this system would mean that the, the village has another valuable asset, has a potential source of revenue, especially once the, the payoff period arrives. And most importantly, I believe, it means that we would make important decisions about the use of that resource and specifically things like what degree of support do we want to supply for low-income residents and, and things like that. In short, we think this would be a community network serving the entire community, and we believe that that just makes sense. Almost done. Um, Springs Net Committee believes that this proposal is both technically and economically sound, that it's consistent with village practices, and that it has strong support from the community. At the same time, we recognize that there's more work to be done. We therefore respectfully request a couple of things from Council. Um, we would very much like uh, to, to be part of a work session with you where we can get into this in more detail, uh, answer any questions that you have, give you some time to formulate those questions. Um, we would ask if, that you consider authorizing an RFP to initiate an engineering study that would verify our, our preliminary cost estimates, which again we think are, are quite, uh, quite conservative and that you consider uh, initiating a marketing study that would solidify our preliminary estimates uh, for subscription rates. Do you have any idea how much either of those two things are going to cost? We, we have estimates uh, which are included in your white paper. Um, I'm not going to those off the top of my head. It was 150 gram, that was just a gross estimate. We could get a more specific price. Uh, we put out a RFP that yes, that would be the, the main benefit of the RFP, would give us an idea of how much an engineering study would actually cost. But the village would and, do the RFP, right? Well, yeah. the village, I think, would have to issue the RFP. Um, we're including the cost of the engineering study in our proposal. So we're not, we're not asking for village money to do that. So, yeah, do you want to elaborate a little bit on just basically how you guys are thinking about the funding? Um, certainly, we're we're considering uh, uh, some form of revenue bond. I, I mean, we're not expert in these matters. We we know that you have people who are some sort sort of revenue bond. Uh, we made projections based on a 20-year uh, term, and we found those to be very favorable in terms of uh, assuming even very pessimistic subscription rates. And we think we made very uh, uh, 
generous allowances for support costs and equipment costs and uh, again an engineering study would would bring some of those into real terms and and uh, make them less uh, not guesswork there we didn't do guesswork but <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, did I answer your question yeah okay how much interaction have you had with our staff who would actually be required to implement the as far as the billing is concerned and as far as using our lines right? well I I'm sorry. Well, yeah. That was a question I was going to ask because early on I know that Johnny Burns had expressed some concern about putting uh, this particular utility on the same poles as the electric um, because of the access. And I wanted to know if those concerns had been addressed well, with Johnny. Again, that, that is a key factor in the engineering study is to ascertain for sure exactly what what those if we have those problems if we have them where do we have them and what the optional options are for addressing those and so forth we we've mr. Burns as I'm sure you all know is a very very busy man mm -hmm. and we've we've not been able to link up with him other than he has provided us with the poll survey data um, so we do have we have he shared information with us we've not been able to have a meeting with him which we would most certainly do in advance of any kind of a work session with you. Um, well, but he did he did come to speak at a community access panel meeting. Yeah, he that's mm -hmm. yeah that's and where he came and he expressed the concern about um, these lines being on the poles. But didn't he also say that we could work around that? I don't remember that part. He, he okay. could have, but it was a while back. I mean, I, that's what I remember. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, uh, Thor. Um, make ready uh, for, the, for the poles is, is a part of um, any fiber optic infrastructure uh, project mm -hmm. where you know uh, aerial uh, installations occur. Part of the engineering study would allow the examination of every single pole, every single attachment. It would ensure that the proper spacing between uh, cables was adhered uh, to. And uh, we very much want to do that engineering study in you know, and collaborate with Johnny at the same time on that so that we, we're, we're certain that uh, we're making, you know, taking into account everything with respect to uh, poles and construction of the project as well. And there are, are there other alternatives besides pole, putting it on the pole? Absolutely. Uh, burial is, of course, the other option. Uh, and there's also a technology called micro-trenching, which is very popular in Europe, uh, where they actually um, put a very, they take a salt, uh, Effectively, it's a salt blade, but they you know, very slice down. The, uh, it's a slice down the street, and there's a certain kind of fiber optic uh, cable that goes perfectly in that crack, and then they just seal it right back over. Um, and it's very uh, un, un, unobtrusive uh, methodology. So there's really three uh, primary methods that we would be looking at for fiber optic engineering. One of the communities we were in touch with, Sandy, Oregon, has uh, done similar project and they just completed it this last year they did the whole network underground and it was a whole lot more difficult there because they have very rocky soil uh, compared to what we have here in Yellow Spring so going underground here would be even easier. Did I hear you allude to the fact that the costs for the engineering studies would not be borne by the village? We, we have those built into our uh, so they would be borne those, by those the village? Are, no those are built into our uh, project proposal that would be part of the funding of the of the project itself. But but we would have to come up with the funding for the studies. Before we and if the yes. and if the studies didn't prove um, didn't viable. That's correct. prove viable, then we would then that would be money. Um, that's correct. And and regarding staff, besides Johnny Burns, you guys have also been Melissa Van Zandt's been quite involved, right? Melissa's been very involved and has been most helpful to us. Um, Are there not potentially community partners that could um, contribute to some of the some of the studies? Are, are there people, other people who will benefit from this, um, other people that will potentially financially benefit that um, could be involved in helping to fund the engineering? Uh, I believe there are probably all kinds of possibilities in that regard. We actually discussed a number of um, ideas that were a, l a little more unusual uh, to, to get this thing off the ground. I, I'm, again, that's probably something that we would we would just want to. Uh, 
more than likely that's a little bit out of our pay grade, I guess, is the, is the, is the gist of what I'm trying to say here. We, um, we, we made assumptions and we built uh, projections based on our limited knowledge of how that sort of thing works uh, with advice from Melissa. And uh, we, we understand that you're the ones that will have to make the hard decisions. And, although, and so we didn't want to get too far out there. Although, I um, mean, what you're asking of our staff, of council and our staff, is, is an incredible amount of work and a, an incredible amount of financial investment that, as far as I know, our staff is already maxed. So well, I, I'm just, I'm concerned you know I think we were looking for SpringsNet to to bring that expertise to us and not for us to have to reinvent the wheel here okay I, I um. aren't, aren't, aren't you talking about doing or making a request to do a work session with us yes so it just seems to me yes. that that's our primary this kind request. of discussion would be something for that's what I was going to ask I mean how far is this discussion tonight going what's the process by which you know this we're trying to get enough information. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to let them know is what I'd like to know. I mean, it, what I'd like them to come prepared to a work session to talk about is that um, is tools for our staff how the village can take on an entirely new utility and exactly how this is. I mean, I think part of what we need to understand is how other communities did this and the kind of challenges that they faced and you know are there i i mean i would i would want to know did uh in some of these other communities um did they run into problems they didn't expect what were those problems right. um you know was it all i mean it's a great concept <laughs> right. but i want to know more concretely these 80 communities i don't know how f I don't know when communities started uh, doing this, how many years out it is that, that uh, communities have had experience with their municipal uh, system and sort of, you know, we should be able to learn from that. We're not going to be the first, so we right. should be able to learn from that. And I would want that, I would want a lot more information right. about that because that, that's going to tell us what we may run into. Right. Um, yep. I, I mean, the I good think, things and the bad. Right. You know? I, I don't think we need to be sold on this as a project. I mean, I think, I think it's undeniable that having fiber in Yellow Springs would be incredible. It would be incredible for economic development. It would be incredible for the community. So I don't need, I don't need the whole front yes. end of the stuff to sell me on the project. I need to understand how we're going to afford it, and I need to understand how we're the going to administer it, how, just exactly how this is going to work in Yellow Springs. Thank you. And we have, a, we have done a lot of work on that. We have and the no, take a rate. number I mean, of multiple scenarios that we, we would be happy to discuss with you, and, and including all kinds of I, options for how it gets staffed, how it gets supported, combinations of public-private you know, partnerships and Contract. I mean, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, we're going to be finalizing our goals tonight, and so uh, this work sessions that's being requested, um, you know, partly we need to think about, well, what are our, all our priorities and where does that fit in in terms of time frames? Um, right. So I feel like rather than trying to commit to something at this moment, we need to first finalize our goals and understand, you know, where are the priorities there and what kind of a workload are we talking about? And then we can kind of figure out right. wh when to fit that work session in. I, I would add that there are, there are many companies that would be willing to assist or even take over most of these duties from the staff. So I don't think the village would necessarily have to take on a lot of these responsibilities as far as designing the network, determining the type of funding and all that. There, there are resources available. Now, a lot of them uh, you know, uh, that uh, have been used by other municipalities Again, we've been in close contact with Sandy, Oregon, and several of the contractors that work with them, and they they've done you know detailed engineering studies already. So this has been done in the past. Right. There's lots of examples out there. I mean, I think I agree with Judith. I think you know at some point when we do agenda planning at the end of the meeting, we'll I don't know if we'll talk about it tonight, but I think you're hearing from all four of us that obvious that absolutely a work session is is fine. I mean, I'm absolutely willing to have a work session. I think how it works into our schedule, how it works into the rest of the goals for 2016 is what we're going to have to work on. And, and I guess what you would hear from that is that, is that you know, the more that is brought to us um, 
the easier it is. And I guess I will say one more thing if we're, since I think we're going forward, is that there has been some question of a potential conflict of interest r around this, and I'd like to make sure that that is Certainly. resolved before it comes back to council. Certainly. Okay. Uh, just, just to wrap up, we would like to encourage uh, uh, members of council as well as the entire community to visit the website that we've set up. We're uh, assembling a fairly large body of educational material about this kind of a project, what it's, what's involved, the very kinds of questions you asked me earlier, how does this work? Um, we want everybody to know as much as possible about all of this, and we believe that uh, as people learn learn about it, they'll uh, they'll agree with us that it's a great idea and that we're just the people to do it. I, I, I like did want to say, say I, yeah. I really would like to thank you all for all the work you've been doing. I mean, I read the whole thing, <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't really understand much about it before at all. So I, I mean, this is a great document. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for everything you've done. Very complete. And yeah, I mean, just to underscore what Scott just said, um, you know, one resource is the Fiber Forum that uh, Karen and I attended um, that happened, you know, early last year. And that was where we brought in a lot of speakers, some of them, you know, over the web. And that's all accessible as well. Just And they shared their successes and their surprises, and, and it was a very balanced presentation, so. Yeah, all that video is available on the website. Right. Yeah, I wanted to say, too, maybe, we maybe sound a little unfriendly uh, in, in response to all this. I hope we didn't, but, uh, but just to, uh, I just, we need, I think we're going to need more information. We just have to figure out where to fit in the schedule, but I appreciate the work that's been done, and it's, if we can make this happen, it would be fantastic. We look forward to answering your questions, every one of them. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Thanks a lot. The whole it looks like the whole committee's here, so <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, next, we'll go back and pick up uh, the public hearings and legislation, resolution 2016-07. Um, I'm not even going to have... Uh, Judy, why don't you read it in by title? Yes, this is Adopting the Village Council Annual Goals for 2016. Okay. So, um, at the last meeting, and I believe, I'm not sure, but at the last meeting we kind of went through the ones that were there, um, and I believe that at least, I'm hoping that um, the first one, two, three, four, five, six, are basically what was there before um, modified and changed uh, for our discussion at the last meeting. I hope I got everything right um, on the changes that were to be made. One, two, three. So it's basically everything before village justice system. Mm -hmm. Did you want to talk about any of them now? Well, I mean, I, I thought we, I felt like we talked about them at the last meeting, really. Um, we, and, and basically all that it was was some editing um, to, we, we actually eliminated two or three of them um, that we didn't feel that we either, either had they been completed or we put them, we folded them into a different one. So, so the water projects, we basically, the water project is basically going to revolve around um, the plant itself, constructing a plant and the wellhead protection plan. Um, which has already been acknowledged by Environmental Commission, uh, create a sustainable economic development strategy. Um, I think that some of the, the activities may be slightly different. Um, we update and, and de or develop um, ED tools, including the economic development revolving loan fund and, and incentive policy, property inventory and web presence. These are things that we've talked about at the Economic Sustainability Commission develop a plan to address business expansion needs. And um, this was, I think, left over from the last time. Update comprehensive land use plan and economic sustainability plan is necessary to meet goals. I think, I think that before it said update both of them, and I think that that maybe was a little more than we needed to yeah, have in as there. As necessary is good. So, um, and then develop a strategy for fiscal sustainability. We rolled the property tax into that, um, which we have a separate passage of the property tax levy, um, consider additional revenue options, uh, develop a capital plan for village assets, and then we also have included the um, best use of village-owned property on that. 
um, sidewalk repairs and construction. Um, I added complete downtown streetscape, but basically um, the analysis and recommendations from staff, which includes an analysis of the um, of the sidewalk system itself and uh, recommendations for how we fund um, how we fund the projects. I, and I just added that council needs to approve a plan for the sidewalk. I mean, we've had recommendations and we've had analysis, but council so far hasn't come up with a plan. Um, so just just add council. Just council approval of a plan for a sidewalk repair. Mm -hmm. Of, of uh, uh, implementation and funding strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That, yeah. The goal should probably be the approval of the plan and the, the strategy and funding would be the method for implementation. You know, we really have had the analysis and recommendations from staff because we got a report from John and we also had some, some financial input from Melissa, I believe. So do, you, do we want to take out analysis and recommendation from staff and just say council approval of implementation strategy and funding? Sounds good. Okay. Um, and then work with community organizations, commission and staff to develop a plan to reduce energy use and increase environmental sustainability. All that I had there was develop the village solar project. I don't know if there was I have something from the Environmental Commission, Okay, uh, which would be, what's that second, under anticipated results, um, environmentally friendly uh, landscaping, let's see, uh, the, the Environmental Commission is going to be putting for, forward sometime this year options for uh, an ordinance and then educational materials on how people can have environmentally friendly and climate friendly landscaping. So, um, however, however that could be worded as a um, result. Or, but, but that's, and then the, the I don't know if that's a council goal though. I mean, it's not a council goal yet because we haven't oh, been presented true. with it. That's true, okay. I mean, it seems like I, I would, it feels like we probably do based upon <coughs> what environmental and energy board are doing. It seems like we probably do um, have something more that uh -huh. concrete to put under um, this, what I would consider the sustainability um, goal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, besides just the solar project. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, some of the work that the resilience. Right. Well, I mean. Well, like this the is a climate work. action plan, for example. Sure. Right. Council Continue has. work on climate action yeah. plan. Right. And I mean, I, I always think of these as a work in progress, right. so we should be able to add things. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next, we've got develop and implement a plan and proof of concept to build a, munici a municipally owned fiber optic network that will support all Yellow Spring citizens and encourage economic development. Um, you know, we've got the, I think we, we all know what the, what the, uh, what we hope to attain, the anticipated results. Um, encourage collaboration be between Springs Net and CAP. That is probably something that needs to be developed a little bit farther. And I'm not sure, Brian, do you have? Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, what's happened is Springs Net has just taken this on. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I guess what what we talked about at the last community access panel meeting was that if we do move forward with this, that maybe the panel has a role in oversight to help council. But at this point, I don't think CAP does okay. have a role. I mean, I think this is Springs Net bringing it to us and then, you know. Um, but maybe maybe adding the work session, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that should definitely happen. So, I mean, it, so it, it seems to me that encourage that that goal or that 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 action isn't 
doesn't apply at all. So what would you yeah, what so would you I, consider the appropriate action? So I, I think it's sounds like it's work session. And then it's we need to do I, I guess we've been given some recommendations that seem to make sense. The engineering study and possibly the marketing study. I mean, I'm at least considering those actions to test viability. Work session with SpringsNet to consider or discuss next steps. Yep. And then maybe consider engineering and marketing studies. I mean, I, I, I do have to say that, that the goal of developing and implementing a plan and proof of concept, it may be a bit, it may be jumping us ahead a, a step. We have to first decide. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, I feel like we have our goal. Our goal is ahead of our actions. It, well, maybe, I, maybe the word implement is the problem because, you know, plan and proof of concept I think the idea was that we could see it. Proof on paper. of concept. What does that mean? It means that you prove that it, the concept that will work. That, that's the. So that should thing. be maybe the first question, the thing that should mm -hmm. be listed. You know, first that has to happen before you develop a plan, right? Something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that develop a proof of concept may cover it. I mean, there's there's a plan embodied in that for sure. So. Well, um, I, I mean, it seems like it's more about ex just exploring, exploring the idea, exploring creating or developing a fiber optic network in Yellow Springs. That seems like that's what we're doing. Say it again. It, we're just exploring, exploring. Yeah, the I like development that. of a fiber optic network in Yellow Springs. Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. good. Personally, I don't want to lose the proof of concept because it's more of an action I mean we've been exploring it for well then let's a year. put let's put the action let's put that action over under the action items okay So explore development of a municipally owned fiber optic network that will support all citizens and encourage economic development. It, uh, one of the mm -hmm. anticipated results, reduced cost via efficiency. I'm not quite sure what that means. Does that mean it's going to reduce the cost of the service to citizens because of? Well, yes, uh, because um, village services because it's can right be, here yeah and part of that would be for example our police department uh you know is, is connected into the internet so if we had cheaper you know better internet that would be one area of efficiency same for our remote reads and and all the other activities that are sort of in this sort of smart smart city planning smart village so that is, that is what that referred to Okay. Yeah, and educational opportunities, by the way, are there because the schools have highlighted on many occasions how important it is to their students as, as they, they you know, need to have mm -hmm. access right, to the yeah. internet. I mean, right, yeah. That's, that's an easy one to yep. understand. Um, so is it, is it develop a proof of concept or is that, does that, is that the right wording under the actions? Yeah. Okay. And is that, is that, is the proof of concept, is that mostly about um, ensuring that it's financially viable or does that include operationally viable? Both. Okay. Both. Okay. Okay. Uh, SpringsNet. So are you saying community access panel is out of this completely or is this just going to be? Yes. Okay. So that is the resolution to the potential conflict of interest okay is 
It just at this point, community access panel doesn't need to have a role in this because SpringsNet's really taken it on. Um, okay. But I, I think you know, moving forward, you know, if we really <laughs> did do this, I do wonder if we'd want some kind of oversight. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I will, so if we're, if we're, and, and you'll notice that I removed the, the ranking um, column, and I, I thought that that's what we decided. Um, in my view, um, the order in which they're placed is, is more a matter of expediency than, than anything else. So I'm, you know, I, I would be satisfied to just leave them and it doesn't mean anything, say anything about the, the last two other than they were the last two. So I'll just turn those over to the two of you to discuss. Um, okay, I'll, I'll discuss the village justice system review and update. Um, uh, Marianne and I talked about it, uh, but I uh, did most of the work on it. And I did uh, reach out to the mayor, though I didn't get a chance to talk with him, and um, had a conversation with Chief Hale. <coughs> Excuse me. was very pleasant and uh, just to you know keep them in the loop uh, regarding this since it involves their areas of acti of work um, so just to read it out uh, the <clears throat> first column there so the the um, goal is village justice system review and update um, and then anticipated results stronger more effective mayor's court that incorporates restorative justice principles and has an increased referral rate from the YSPD. Strengthened public trust in the uh, Yellow Springs Police Department across race, age, and income groups. Increased public understanding of the Yellow Springs Police Department policy and practice. Updated police department policy to reflect best practices and community values. Those are the anticipated results. Activities required. Um, <laughs> We're recommending that the Village Council create a Village Justice System Task Force to research and develop recommendations regarding the following. The, the Mayor's Court, restorative justice practices, the YSPD practice and policy, <coughs> new developments in municipal policing that address institutional racism, and the last one, alternative municipal policing approaches to drug control. The time frame that's being proposed is 2016 to 2018. The person responsible, the village council, the justice system task force, and Patty uh, as our village manager, and the resources, uh, the village council, human relations commission, the village solicitor, Mayor Fobert, Chief Hale, the village mediation program, you at the U.S. Department of Justice and um, initiatives in other communities. And I think at the top I had had the Justice System Task Force as a resource as well. So I don't know if that needs to be there. So that is the proposal. So I guess for consistency, I mean, just a small point, but council yeah. and the task force, maybe we don't have to have in the last column. Okay. Just, and I mean, I and I would think that Mayor Fobert and Chief Hale would be more than um, resources. That, that they're more than resources. That they're going to be responsible. I, it's their uh, their departments that we're talking about. So yeah. they're going to be responsible for implementing okay. whatever is decided. Okay. Yeah, and I was I wasn't sure what those columns exactly. Right. The only other work. thing is because so. it the last. The last two, well, it's really not important as much as the, um, there are a couple of things related to the PD where the goal is talks about the justice system. And I know that, maybe I'm reading, I know that, that when it comes to justice that, that um, Chief is very, um, always talks, that that's not the police department's role. The police department is public safety. It's not meting justice. So I'm wondering if we should, expand the goal or say the goal differently or something to separate out the mayor's court restorative justice piece from police policy and policing issues maybe when we when I looked at uh, when I looked it up uh, criminal justice system you know it 
if you look it up, it's considered part of the, the, uh, the police department's considered part of the criminal justice system, what I looked up anyway. Um, but uh, Mary Ann and I both thought that criminal justice system <laughs> sounded a little harder than maybe we wanted to describe it. But, um, well, I think it probably, I don't know that we've actually had that type of discussion with Chief since Judith has been back oh. on council. So maybe, Chief, you can explain just briefly how you see that, just so Judith can understand what Karen's trying to say. The, the police department doesn't mean I mean, we justice. Could, yeah. Go ahead. You want to hear? I, I mean, I think there's, and Judith and I talked, I think there are situations I think the police department has to be aware of that they would be a great <coughs> fit for sending to the restorative justice system. Again, from I, I think technically my job is not justice. It's, it's not for me to find guilt and be judgmental. Right. Our job is to report it. If you're a victim and you want to report that someone has assaulted you, our job is to take that report. It would then be Mayor Fogart or the, the judge's responsibility to find uh, a resolution to that if you as the victim is amenable to it. So that's sort of, I think, where we're at. I, I do think that the police department can be aware of, you know, certain situations probably lend themselves more to restorative justice than other things where there's truly an assault or something, right. a criminal damaging, <laughs> et cetera. And in that way, I think we can develop policies that would be helpful in that. I, I think what I'd suggest is that, is that we almost just draw a line across almost the middle, middle of that and cr put it into two separate goals. So separate out the policing. Well, but the... Can, can you make them sub-goals? Say it I mean, again? Can you make I'm just them looking up criminal justice system. I mean, uh, it says the system of law enforcement that is criminal justice system, the system of law enforcement that is directly involved in appre apprehending, prosecuting, defending, sentencing, sentencing, and punishing those who are suspected or convicted of criminal offenses. I, I, think the what it, I think the difference is you're looking at it as a system and Karen's looking at it as parts of the system. So you're, when, you, when you made your goal, you made it as, an, as uh, the entire system. Right. The, the mayor's court and yeah, the and the part department. of the reason for that is because we wanted the task force to be looking at both, and we oh, saw okay. them so as I, linked. I didn't understand. Yes. That. Yeah, okay. yeah, yes. I think that's the difference. Is because you're you're going back to what the chief said about it's not the police's right job to meet out. No, I'm not. I'm not right. suggesting that right. uh, the apprehending or right. you know that's uh, that's still part of the system. It's part of yeah. So that's that's the way I was thinking about it. I, I'm wondering yeah, if we could. It just enlarge the title of it and say village justice and public safety system if, if the chief or if people feel that public safety captures the uh, PD part of the equation I think if you look at it as a, as a system I, I think justice village justice system encompass it as the entire system I don't think the chief has a problem yeah no I didn't yeah I, ju I just think and we just took out criminal because like we said a lot of what's happening here are these minor by are more minor violations and mm -hmm. we just thought it sounded better <laughs> I like it and so so are, are we gonna keep do you that? feel more car is that yeah I mean if, if hearing that and and it seems like Patty's fine with it chief's fine with it so that's I and, and I honestly wasn't wasn't realizing that you were expecting that task force to handle all of it. I just I just know that when we when we tackled the task force last year, the ACE task force last year, we decided very distinctly to separate the two discussions, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why I um, I was still thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so back to the last column, resources. Mm -hmm. How do we capture? TCN and, and some of the other. I think we should just add it. Okay, but Personally. I guess it, uh, yeah. But I was also thinking about um, you know yeah, some of the, the folks that you've brought together, Marianne and and Catherine, and I, so I don't know if there's a more inclusive. But well, certainly. Nami should Ma, Nami could be in there mm -hmm. as a resource. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, I think it's one of those things that, you know, just mm -hmm. like you say, can be changed and added. Mm -hmm. okay. Can we make it any shorter? I try. <laughs> Tell your words to make it shorter. You're, you're not to the long one yet. So. I know. I know. That's what I'm thinking about. You know, I have this thing about two pages. <laughs> yeah, well. That's my goal. I did better than Marianne did. <laughs> All council oh. paperwork should be on two pages. <laughs> well, maybe we could have, well, maybe there could be like a cover page with the main goal thing and then, you know, additional material for, to dig into it. Although, okay, the logistics. Okay. <coughs> okay. Do we want to move on to the next one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, um, the original uh, chart that Judy sent out didn't quite capture what I had sent her, and so she redid it. Thank you, Judy, and put it on the our table. So hopefully. You're looking at the what she had on the table. Um, so Judith and I uh, talked about the objective, uh, the goal of developing mixed income housing on the glass farm. And uh, we didn't come to total agreement about how to frame this as a goal. So I put in actually two goals one which is the overarching goal and so in the new chart that's what you see first in italics so the the overarching goal would be to develop mixed income housing on the glass farm that meets village goals and values and also in terms of the values i felt that all of the values are actually included in this goal but this is a very long-term goal I think. Um, I, I put in 2016 to 2020, uh, five years, but frankly, I would suspect it would be more like 10 years. Um, so then in italics are listed the results that we would expect from that overarching goal, which would be a mix of rental and home ownership and affordable units that meet the following criteria and needs. So those needs are the constituency groups, that have particular need for housing. Um, getting data on the balance of the kind of housing that we need. And then incorporating environmental <coughs> and sustainability and uh, uh, social just, well, social justice would be included. I didn't actually write that in. But in incorporating the various uh, sustainability principles that we have in terms of the housing development. That, that would be that long-term five to 10 year goal. So, but for 2016, what it, a goal, a manageable goal, would be to develop a planning process for mixed income housing on the glass farm. And basically what that means is to get the data that we need to get in order to be able to move forward. Um, for example, there are some practical considerations like the infrastructure that uh, exists around the glass farm, what infrastructure would need to be changed, the access uh, roads, potential roads that leave, lead into the glass farm, the characteristics of the land itself, where you could put housing, where maybe you wouldn't want to. So those are, that, that some, some of that information we have. Some, uh, and then there is looking at a process that would be transparent and would involve the community. And then there is also looking at the kind of data that we would want, housing market studies and things like that. So um, that is, why this this is a very this has a lot of things included in Can, it. I mean, it's really about hiring a consultant. I mean, everything almost everything you have 
in this. You think so? Oh, oh absolutely. Who's well, going to assess the topography? And I mean, I also think. Well, well, we know there's. We have data about the topography. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to go around and do soil borings, but we have data in terms of soil type, uh, elevation. Um, so. But I think what Karen's saying is that that would need to be assessed to see that it would support the housing yes. development. Yes. Yeah. So that's where the, yes, we have basic data, but that's where the <coughs> consultant would come in. Well, it occurs to me, I think all this detailed work is great, but maybe it doesn't have to all be listed out. And I wonder if we can just pull develop a planning process, put it into actions required. It'll be two pages, but we don't uh, want to, but we don't want to lose all uh -huh. this information, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so that can be, that can live somewhere else, but maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be on the main goal document. Um, but I think it's great. Right, so we can take out, out overarching goal and just have that develop mixed income housing in the glass farm that meets village goals and values have that be right. well that was what judith and i were struggling with but or have that, that be the, the goal right and then, then develop planning process is the action that's at least the first one i, I mean i don't know if, so what are you suggesting is the goal the overarching one okay develop mixed income housing on the glass farm mm -hmm. have that be the goal right okay and then and develop a planning process is our and we don't need to repeat it's our mixed action income. required and then Maybe that's all we need to list for now, because as you said, this is a long-term process. That's the activity. Well, and I think, and uh, I think that, yeah, I think that some of the research. I think that that there's actually some research in the, in the, um, in the second column, the anticipated results, um, research, a balance of, home of home types or housing types um, needed or something like that. I mean, we've talked about housing survey for ever, so. A decade. <laughs> mm -hmm. Research housing needs or, mm -hmm. and I mean that's, and that is not at all to, to, to suggest that the one, that what's been identified, I think that housing for, I think the, I think the first one is fine. Housing for identified constituency groups such as I don't know if I'd say constituency, I'd probably say underserved, maybe underserved or um, groups or I mean if we wanted to leave constituency we, constituency and that's fine, but um, yeah. development incorporates best right. Yeah. I mean it won't be all underserved. Um, it, necessarily. Well, I guess it depends on how we define underserved. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't, I mean, it. Is that my phone? Great. I think it is. It is. Well, what, I was going, I'm, I'm getting together with Patty tomorrow, yeah. and one of the topics that I wanted to talk about was this. Okay. So because I, I have a couple ideas just looking so at it. So I'm about. thinking maybe you and I could come up with some yeah. Yeah, streamlining. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I have a couple ideas. Okay. So So do we want to just hold this then, I mean just for approval for the next meeting? I don't see how we can't. <laughs> It's got We're a lot of red lines. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean but you know we No, we've I think got it's good. It. Yeah. I think it's good. Yeah, I think and it's not going to stop us from moving ahead. Right. <laughs> so. Okay, very good. Thank you all. Okay, good all right. job, everybody. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so I did, we didn't even get a motion or anything on that, so we don't even have to. So next on the agenda is the retreat uh, discussion, preliminary agenda discussion location. Um, Judy, would you review um, what we have set up so far? Yeah, so far we're set up to meet at Antioch University Midwest on, I think it's March 24th, it is, um, from 9 to 4.30, 4 o'clock, whatever is needed in that regard, so that's, that's set to go. So the next step really is setting the agenda. Okay. Um, and I won't order any pizza with pesto on it. 
Got it. So uh, really, nine that's, to four. Just, just your details. That's all I need. And move it on forward. So agenda items, folks. Anybody been thinking about that? Commissions. Okay. Eight to nine to four. Did you just say? Commissions. As a general topic. Um, I, th I think to be more specific how we, um, how council and commissions work together. I think I would also um, suggest under commissions we put something about um, sunshine law training of some kind. Well, and everyone is supposed to, you know, with the roles and responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, like Put him on speaker. I know. Yeah, I'll I'll just get, call right to ask him if he wants to join the meeting. <laughs> yeah. I guess I could turn my, actually mute my phone. Is there something we should do there around the goals? Because we've got some, in terms of. Yeah, I these, are, these are some big Well, goals should, we, why, should we do a timeline? Goals timeline? Goals? Maybe. That way we can talk yeah, about. Sort of, yeah, uh -huh. how we're. Um, it just seems that we've got a lot of kind of big goals and uh, they're great and just sort of how are we going to manage it all. I think I actually recall that we may have done that not at the last retreat but I think the one before that. Okay. Uh -huh. Can, I'm sorry to go back a little bit to the commissions, can maybe some topic like commission best practices it encompasses a lot of things but it seems as if there's a lot that comes up around commissions and if it's just a best practices approach that might cover yeah yeah um, yeah because I, I think it would be helpful since we did all this work last year you know with updating the ordinances the roles and responsibility statement it'd probably be good to digest that and and see where we're at I have to say tonight I was very impressed with all the work. Oh, amazing, the yeah. Yeah, the commissions all are doing. Commission it's amazing. Reports. Amy, yeah. anything in particular that uh, our legal counsel is interested in us talking about? I haven't spoken to Chris. I don't know if he has any ideas. I think the Sunshine Law training, just a general one for all board and commissions, is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why don't we flesh it out? I mean, the goals timeline and maybe just just um, fleshing out a little bit. I mean, that could that could really take at least half the time easily. So. Well, uh, and I will say, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about that, you know, the, the schools and, and their strategy plan. And, you know, it'd be interesting to, to have an exercise where we did kind of specifically articulate some of those things in our minds. Um, so. Some of what things? Just with these goals, you know, what really looking at what those strategies, mm -hmm. how they're going to map out. I mean, it's a timeline, but it's also, you know, Judith, you mentioned bandwidth and, and some of these other things and prioritizing. Right. And you do have two more meetings still before right. the retreat. So. And it obviously, it's a public meeting, it will be advertised. So, um, okay. So are did we I done? see it's going to be at uh, Antioch University? Do, at which Midwest? room? Yeah. Judy, do you well, know? I can't remember the room number, but it's okay. halfway down on the first floor. It has a sink, and it's sort of big. And you can move stuff around so you can configure it however you like. Yeah, and we might want to think about um, think about interfacing. If there's any kind of electronic interface, I know they have yeah. whiteboards. You might want to think there about um, mm -hmm. making sure we have the correct kind of markers and we don't destroy their whiteboards. <laughs> Um, and I don't know if we want any um, of the sheets, flip charts. flip charts. We might want to just take something along. But everybody now just takes pictures of the whiteboards. <laughs> I, I prefer sheets. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, next, um, next item of discussion is a levy update. Um, Melissa put a reminder in our packet um, to remind citizens mm -hmm. and council and everyone that March 15th is our primary. It is probably going to be 
not only for the fact that our levy is on the ballot, I think that there may be other pressing things on the ballot that are going to <laughs> make people interested in going to the polls this time. It's yeah. going to be probably the most exciting uh, primary we'll, we'll have in a long time. So, um, so just March 15th, um, we did, um, and I will say that, that um, because of the timing of the March 15th um, levy, um, or uh, as, as opposed to thinking it was going to be in May, we were planning on a primary in May, um, just didn't get a committee together. And um, so given the fact that we're on kind of our third try on this one and, and the last time um, the community was very supportive of the levy, um, and we feel like we've been um, good stewards of the money, we feel like we've been um, explaining the, the financials and the budget pretty well every year. Um, we decided that we wouldn't go for a, uh, a committee to do fundraising, to go out and do fundraising to create um, campaign materials. So we did create a um, basically an informational piece that will go in the um, water and electric bills um, for the, mm -hmm. that will go out the beginning of March. So mm -hmm. that is the piece that we have in here. Um, it's actually a rack card size on cardstock, I believe. So that's what's going to be in the bills. I know that Melissa has prepared some additional information. Um, is that is that to be discussed at the next meeting? Yeah, I think that um, what I would like is if um, if there is any additional information um, that council or um, the community uh, would like to see informational um, or educational wise. Um, regarding our expenditures or you know where the money goes anything like that any t um, any additional materials I'd be willing to uh, put some stuff together to put into the next council packet so um, I know that <coughs> the informational piece that's going in the utility bills um, talks about uh, the millage and um, the general fund revenues <coughs> and kind of what uh, levy funds help pay for but if there's any more um, information um, in terms of expenses on maybe a more in-depth level that I could provide, I'm more than willing to do that. I'd found a um, document that was shared with council earlier in uh, 2015 um, regarding budget savings. It, it looked at the 2014 operating budget, compared it to the 2015 operating budget, and it showed um, all of the savings that were uh, made operationally across all the budgets, including the general fund, which is where the levy impacts the most. So um, I have a couple of things that I could provide in the next packet. So just depending on what council would like to see, just let me know. I would encourage us to um, talk to our, obviously our, our, the people we know, obviously talk about the levy if we have um, if we um, are parts of organizations, um, I know that as Brian uh, talked to the school board, I think he's going to talk to the McKee group also. So any of us, um, I think that we can take that on to, um, and I'm sure Melissa can get copies of, the, of this piece to take along if you'd like, mm -hmm. um, and any other information you might want to take along. But um, writing letters to the editor is encouraged. I was going to say, um, maybe we could each a member of the council you know some of our friends who are act you know would be willing to write a lot you know maybe we should each be uh, trying to make that happen and with our email lists if uh, do we have a simple electronic version of this that we've each mm -hmm. that we've gotten mm -hmm. that's okay. um, the one that was in the packet I think that that one was in the packet the side in, by side maybe mm -hmm. there's one in the packet I was thinking it's because <laughs> Because I'm not so literate. Maybe illiter uh, so. Uh, maybe if we could get, if I could get this anyway, just a, uh, an electronic copy that could be attached, mm -hmm. you know, easily attached to a an email mm -hmm. uh, communication, something like that. Melissa, could you talk about a question that came up? Um, was sort of the renewal, a uh, uh, clarification on renewal with 8.4 mils versus actual dollars? Could yeah, I had, I had actually sent, um, I'd called over to the county auditor's office this morning 
and um, they sent me over to the treasurer's office that said you need to talk to the auditor's office. <laughs> so um, I did send an email to David Graham, and he provided a pretty lengthy explanation that I left on the printer. Um, but it, I did glance at it. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing because it was late in the day that I got it. Um, but I can forward that on to everyone or provide that in the next uh, council packet. But it basically explained that the 8.4 mils is still the same rate. And it explained um, in depth, it was a fairly lengthy email, as to how the millage is calculated and such. So I did get a formal um, explanation from the county auditor that I can provide. But 8.4 mils is still where it has remained. Okay. But if property values change, the millage changes. Is that correct? Our millage, it has from. I didn't like. I said I didn't get to read the entire thing because it came really late and I was in the middle of something else. So it kind of threw me for a loop. Um, but it, it said that it's it's maintained at 8.4 mils. And I think and I seen in there towards the end that he did talk about how property values played into that. So um, I'll I'll forward that to everybody. But okay. I apologize. I left it on the printer. But the upshot is. It's the same amount of dollars, right? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, whatever the, the relationship is. between the different values, or ex if there's new houses, mm -hmm. can change a little bit. But right, and, and if council remembers one thing that struck us odd last year when the property valuations came out was that some of the properties in town the value had gone down, but then some of the other properties had actually increased in value, and that had struck us odd at the time. Uh, because it just didn't seem to make a lot of sense, but maybe it just ended up that it worked out that way. And, and if I may answer your question, Ryan, the, the money can change depending on the property values. The millage stays the same, but the millage caps, captures a certain amount of money per dollar of the value of your home, but of each property. So if the property values have gone up and the money captured from that property will be higher, the millage will remain the same. See, I, I thought the money remained the same, but the millage changed. It's yeah, the okay. opposite? The no. millage does not change. It's okay. Level levy, so the millage will stay the same. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I do understand what you're saying. That's not the way it was explained to me before. Okay. She's an attorney. Which may or may not be an attorney. But David Graham's explanation well. That's but, this, yeah. but, but that still means it's a renewal. It is a renewal. It's a renewal. It's Absolutely. I mean, the up and downs are going to be small. Is my, but it, it's, the, it's the total, is my understanding. So if, if 100 new houses were built, for example, um, all of our, uh, what we would pay would probably go down a little bit. Why are you shaking now? No, I mean, the, whatever your home is worth, that is the percentage that you're paying, period, end of story. But it has yeah. to all total. No. If 100 new That's homes a, are built. No. They are all paying that percentage mm -hmm. of what their home is valued at, and we oh, make more money as a village. Yes, the okay. amount of money will change. And I, I did not brush up on this particular oh, topic cool. before tonight, so bear with me as I walk through this explanation. But the, the significance in keeping it as a renewal levy to the property owners within the village is that there is a pickup on the part of the state um, where a certain percentage of your tax is being paid um, by the state. And if you loot when you um, let a levy expire, and if you were to replace it with a new levy, which is the difference between a renewal levy and a replacement levy, you lose the pickup. The state has dropped that. They've changed the law. Mm -hmm. So by keeping things as a renewal, um, you, you will keep the pickup on the part of the state. I don't. I, I used to know what the numbers are. I don't stop my head down what those numbers are. But there is a percentage of being paid by the state as long as you keep it this way. And the, the county auditor provides us with an estimate of what we'll receive and it stayed relatively close. I mean, it, it has fluctuated a little bit over the last couple of years, but it stays relatively um, close. Um, but their estimation, so what we're, what we're receiving our money for, we do the tax levy in July, or I mean the, uh, the oh my gosh, the uh, tax budget in July. And it takes into consideration uh, the levy figures uh, that we would receive the following year because we are collecting in 2016 property taxes that were uh, collected by the auditor in 2015. So if we had um, new property that was, uh, or new housing that was developed, um, they would know that ahead of time so that we could anticipate receiving those funds the following year. So when they give us their estimates, they have a handle on what's going on. 
in terms of our housing markets at the time because we get it a year in arrears. So you're basically so you're saying that the reason it stayed at around seven hundred sixty thousand dollars is that we just haven't mm -hmm. had any new housing. We haven't had significant new housing. And property values have stayed relatively stable. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're still capturing that eighty four cents per mm -hmm. right eighty four cents per hundred dollars. Per hundred of mm -hmm. property value. Okay. So it sounds like we'll have some a little bit more information mm -hmm. at the next meeting, and Melissa is going to share um, the the information from David Graham um, mm -hmm. with us um, independently of that. I would appreciate that because I think I I would definitely like to see it. Um, next on the agenda is the Facebook page that we um, discussed and agreed to at the last meeting. I will turn it over to Brian. Um, okay, so first of all, we have uh, 50 likes on our village Facebook page that has not officially been published yet. Um, and that is because, uh, and I'll try not to get into the weeds, but I don't really understand how this got lost in the shuffle, but when our um, international fellows were here and did research and talked about municipalities turning off comments, I don't know where they got that information because you cannot do that on a Facebook page. And that's why when the chief said he thought he did that, you cannot. You can do that on a personal page, you know, like Marianne's page, Karen's page, but you cannot do that on an organizational Facebook page. I'm also not sure why that wasn't vetted out when the community access panel looked at it, um, but I, I'm guessing that was the confusion that, you know, a personal page which some businesses do. They act as if you know, they are an individual, but that is against Facebook policies. So um, I guess what we need to decide at this point <laughs> is our, you know, so I have not done anything to that Facebook page uh, once I found that out um, because we cannot turn off comments. So I guess you know, what we've got to decide is are we going to move forward and allow comments and have a Facebook page, or are we not going to have a Facebook page? Why don't we try it? See how so FYI, we've gotten two comments. One was a resident that said, thank you for allowing comments. And the other was uh, actually your brother um, tagged the village of Yellow Springs and just said this is a cool place to live and tagged our Facebook page. So. I would suggest something because Patty and I were were on the we were talking on the phone. We were trying. I was trying to help Patty find the page. Mm -hmm. There are about five pages called the Village of Yellow Springs that have been set up by other people. And some of them actually say they're government pages too. I would like. Can we change the name to Yellow Springs Government? And you guys are sure those are pages, not groups? I, I was going from page to page. Okay. I searched, I've looked at, I've looked I at different searched things. I searched Village of Yellow Springs and a bunch of other things popped up. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, right here. And, and, I don't, and that, makes, that starts to make it ineffective. If, if, you're, if people are going to a page. What about the Village of Yellow Springs municipality? Because I, because I thought. Because it's more than government. It's, I thought this was ours. And this is not ours. Can I just see that real quick? Mm -hmm. And in fact, I couldn't find ours until Karen actually sent me the link. Well, because ours is still supposed to be a secret. Mm -hmm. Well, I found, but I found it myself. I found, right. so it's not a secret because Les I mean, Groby has already put it on his Facebook much. page. So. Well, I guess secret is probably not as a misnomer since we talked about it in our meeting but it wasn't official because I was I was looking at this going well why is this person posting this and this and Karen's like that's not our page so so I, um, I just was I, I would just like people to know that they're going on to our page and that it is a government page um, Maybe put the word village in there. It sounds less normal. No, that's no, there are two village, village of Yellow government. Springs government organizations that pop up. Mm -hmm. The first one I think is unclaimed, but somebody, but people are posting on it. 
mean, that's that's something that I don't think we can have. You know, I, I think we need to have a name that's stands um, out, that's different, and that and that I absolutely identifies that it's the government page. So I don't Yellow Springs government. That's the only. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, I think but we're I, I think we're allowed to change our name once. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll try. I mean, I, I, I just came off of a really frustrating situation with um, Facebook posts, you know, very, very outrageous Facebook posts that um, I got in the middle of. And, you know, first question that was asked to me by somebody, somebody said, and the village wants to have a Facebook page, why? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, the, and the comments yeah. that, the comments that, that, um, happened that I was um, I wasn't involved in them but anyway they were they were comments that could not have been removed there would have been no reason to have them removed so I think I just I just want to monitor it and I, I right. want to monitor it very closely except we're not going to be posting about that particular issue and one of the standards is if it's off topic so can they can people post can people po can can people originate a post no. That we can turn off. Okay, and, and now that have. that will help. Yeah, that will help. Okay. Okay. Did we decide? Yeah, I mean, I think that you said. <laughs> I, I yeah, I mean, it's it's gone this this Did far. You, I mean, I'd say let's decide. go ahead and because I know Johnny yeah. was very adamant. It, it, I, like he I think I think the thing yeah. is I mean, that I it, staff has just become a little sensitive to the der derogatory comments. I hope that doesn't happen here. I mean, you know, we'll just have to play it by ear and see. It. You know, we intend to use it for notices and, and things like that, and, and that's the purpose of the page, so we'll see how it goes. And now, just because I, I frankly don't care one way or another. I mean, just because I don't see myself using it. But, so I guess I'd like to understand why, how is this more beneficial than just putting stuff on our a notice board or whatever on our well, website. One issue that I that I think is different is all the commissions have asked, especially HRC, for a way to promote their activities. Yeah. And we have not let them have a Facebook page well, because we can't didn't have they standards. do it on our website? It, websites just aren't interactive enough. I mean, I literally get. I mean, you're on Facebook, Marion, aren't you? You're on, yeah, yeah, I am. But I mean, so so I get notices. I mean, you know, I could sit here and I could run through a list of 50 different things, 50 different things that are posted on my Facebook page, and I could see. I, I don't go to people's websites. You know, you have to go to a website. Most people that are into social media and that are going to benefit from this are on social media on a regular basis and are seeing the posts, they're seeing the feeds. So it's it's just a much more, it's a much quicker, it's in a much more immediate, and it's gonna get to a lot more people than our website. I think we should do both, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's more immediate. I think, you know, if we really, if we wanna have something that's really about emergencies, we should probably consider Twitter. I think that, do you have a Twitter account? Oh, I thought somebody had started one, I thought. Maybe John. Tony. Tony, oh, Tony started one, okay. Um, because that gets to people right away. I don't think a lot of people in Yellow Springs use Twitter, so I'm not gonna, I don't think that's a big deal, but um, I, I think that Facebook's totally different than a website. I will say okay. that. Try it. Okay, yep, we can always, always revise. <laughs> we can always change. I, I, I mean, I, well, I, I feel confident that it's going to be beneficial, um, but if I'm proven wrong, I think we should revisit it. Okay. okay. So next item on the agenda, uh, we received a letter from Reggie Stratton from Antioch College, um, notifying us that uh, in June that they're going to drain the Wellness Center uh, pool to clean and repaint the interior. Um, and um, which is, you know, it, the pool is used an incredible, well, the whole wellness center is, is being used an incredible amount. So um, what they're asking is that uh, we donate um, the water to refill the pool after the repairs are complete. This is actually something we did um, before the 
Wellness Center opened, we actually donated the water to fill the pool the first time. Um, there's a little glitch in that one. I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to happen again, and it, we've been assured that it's only going to be filled one time, and it's going to be with Village Water. So mm -hmm. um, I personally would, I would support it. Patty, do, do you have a, any comments from the staff? Um, I don't remember exactly how much it was. I believe it was in the range of six hundred dollars um, last year. Um, the, I did ask um, Reggie about the fact that they, the last time when we filled it, and then they emptied it again, and then they filled it with water from Springfield. And what he explained to me was that um, they had emptied it because there had been a contractor's mistake, and I think it had something to do with the, the lights. lights. And then he said that because the contractor had agreed to pay for the water to refill it, um, that they filled it with Springfield because the water is um, softened there and requires less chemical treatment than if they were to purchase our water. Um, and so that's why they went ahead and filled it with Springfield water last time. Um, do you, do you have, anybody have anything else they want to add? So how much is that water worth, do we? <laughs> oh, you just said $600. Oh, $600. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think okay. that was what we, um, I think that was the total that we had come up with uh, based on the gallons last time. I, I, I had a comment, actually it was Chrissy Cruz from HRC, um, which I would just like to, I mean, I'd like to put out a sort of a request that she suggested. Um, first of all, um, the wellness center is great, yeah. And uh, it's difficult for lower income people to afford to be able to go to the, well, the wellness center. Chrissy, I guess, had tried to see whether it would be possible for kids who go to the Bryan Center to be able to go like once a week or something to the Antioch, to the pool for free. And she was suggesting, I think, that we see if we could set, if we could arrange something like that. And apparently, they haven't they hadn't responded to that. But I thought that sounded like an interesting request. It seems that that should go through. If if it's anything related to the Bryan Youth Center, it should be coming through staff, though, not from Chrissy to the Wellness Center. I think she was doing it as part of HRC, wasn't she, partly? Mm -hmm. But uh, just to say, they do have uh, a fund there for low-income people that they can apply. But I also think this is, a, this is you know, a, although it's well used, there are times when there's not that many people there, and it probably would be, they probably would be very happy to, you know, maybe make it available to some of the youth who don't have such an easy opportunity to go. But, um, but just to say, they do have, people can apply for a reduced cost. Yeah, I, I, and I think, there has, I think there has been some discussion of certain types of programs like that, and, and I don't think they're quite to the point where they're ready to move forward with those kind of things, other than the, the low income one that they have. Um, I don't think that they're Well, they, I mean, they to, have to the Children's Center goes there, and the Annex School goes there. Okay. <laughs> but I, miss, I oh, would yes. assume that they, that I mean, Those I'm sure they are made a range monitoring that, that the Children's yes. Center and the, the, yes. the Antioch yes. College, the Wellness Center, isn't monitoring. No, right. Right. That's yeah. we don't right. have anybody it would be to a monitor. Program. Right, no, we don't. that's true. That's so true. that's yeah, why they're suggesting staff. Right. I involved. see what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, there are a few questions that I mean, I mean, I realize it's a small amount of money. I love the Wellness Center. I support everything the Antioch College is doing, but. I feel like there are a couple questions we need to ask. One of those being, why, why don't, why doesn't the wellness center have funding to cover costs for the pool? Um, I, I guess I would just want to understand that a little bit better, maybe. And um, I really like this idea of some kind of quid pro quo, um, or for that matter, some kind of matching. Um, I mean. When we did this the first time, I mean, honestly, we did say it was a, a one time. We wanted to support the Wellness Center. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue, but um, yeah, I, there were several concerns besides Chrissy that were raised to me um, as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm reluctant to make a decision, especially since this isn't until June, until maybe we have a little bit more information. Um, that's my opinion. Do you want I, 
I am curious as to it, a year in does seem pretty pretty early for repairs and repainting. I mean, I don't uh, I don't think that they're necessarily. Um, Let's say cleaning and repainting. Cleaning yeah, yeah. and repainting and repainting. So, um, do you want me to see if Reggie is available to come? And, sure. And speak to council, and maybe he can answer. I can give him, you know, these questions yeah. and concerns. And and maybe Monica needs to come or okay. or can talk to Reggie. Um, about programming right. that would because um, I yeah it would be very cool if we could figure out I mean maybe there are vol parent volunteers that would take the kids up there a couple times a month or something I don't know um, but it'd be nice to see that kind of yeah. benefit okay. I mean that's what we do I guess a comparison would be with the John Bryant, Bryant community pottery you know that one dollar a year is in exchange for community programming mm -hmm. and so yeah. I, I appreciate those kinds of things I think they're things we can do but they charge for that community programming they do some John Bryan they do something free every month okay or at a That's, reduced rate they're supposed to do something free every month and they did do it last month okay so I, I mean I, I saw an agreement so yeah. okay um, yeah we, we actually just renewed that agreement well it, it, and I guess you know it, it I, I I would suggest that it's probably they would have the $600 I'm sure they're not they're looking at a community share I'm sure mm -hmm. that it's not because they don't have the $600 yeah, to fill the pool so. right it's a community share um, so God, my phone what is with my phone tonight um, so but I would like to know. I mean, is this going to be an annual thing? That would be. I, that, that would be something. The question know. that came to my mind, and I'm pretty. I'm supportive of the idea of, of uh, you know, doing this for Antioch. But um, and I like the idea of a quid pro quo also. But um, is that when? I mean, they're a nonprofit. But when we have different organizations come to us for different kinds mm -hmm. of, you know you know could you help us here could you help us there could you give us a reduction here you know what are the guidelines we're using and you know how are we thinking about it and that's that's a thought that came up right. for me and we do and we do have question. that process actually that's um when you know the arts council um submitted their request mm -hmm. for 150 dollars mm -hmm. um yeah it, it's and it's about matching it to village goals and there's a short mm -hmm. form to fill so out maybe we just ask them to I would almost liken this more to an economic development incentive, okay. to be quite honest. That's yeah. what it is. It's a business. It's it's an organization. They're, this is helping their bottom line. It's not really. So, um, you know, and, and that's actually part of what but I was being though. discussed about, you know, some of the things with economic development, you know, the water line for Home Inc., for, for C Street, you know, assessing assessing some incentives and figuring out what those incentives are because we were basically awarding an incentive and so I think that that having those kinds of things we're probably not we're not going to have any of it in line directly for this decision but I think just having Reggie here to ask some questions mm -hmm. um, going back to the idea of having something for the Bryant Center kids um, what I think I'm hearing is one if that were to happen we, we don't have the capacity right now to uh, supervise kids in that regard. So that's, that's something that would have to be done. But the other thing was that Antioch would need to, what? They, well, they don't. I mean, they, they don't have the capacity either. They don't have the capacity to manage the kids, but like, they could they put, possibly, they put maybe it on. that's the quid pro quo. Maybe that's part of the quid pro quo that they do because they do. They've got um, lifeguards always. On well, they have lifeguards and they also do um, programming for, for kids. Um, it's maybe called it's Play Something, Play Well, I think that they have. Mm -hmm. So pe parents can come either drop off their kids when they're working out or separately. So, you know, they do have situations where they have teachers or or counselors that can be there with the kids so maybe that would be part of it that you know one day a week one hour a week or something they would give us an hour of their staff time their lifeguard time mm -hmm. it's, yeah it's just a matter of getting it on the schedule you know in her yeah. face and, and, and I hate to I hate to complicate but getting the kids there too how are we going to get the kids there well you know I think if you just did something as simple as there's Dollar Day at Antioch Pool, which runs from 2 to 3 o'clock on Saturdays. End of story. Easy. 
and then except that some of the kids maybe don't have a way to get there and yeah maybe mm. there's a most but of the kids that come here will either walk or ride their bikes yeah. okay anyway. so so yeah oh. okay simple. well that's yeah it could be for the whole community it would be a wild see <laughs> Okay. They're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think something cool could yeah. come out of this. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, next is the manager's report. Um, okay. The installation of the uh, radio read electric meters is continuing. Uh, streetscape bids are out for the final two phases of streetscape. They, we will be accepting bids until February 29th. It will be done in phases, as was discussed with the business owners last year. Um, and by phases, I mean sections. So it will be min minimally disruptive to each business in turn. Um, I want to, before we get on to the, um, to the water uh, plant process, I do have two quick announcements um, that are not in my report. One is that um, Chief did receive a resignation letter from Officer Stephanie Spurlock, who has uh, unfortunately for us accepted a position with Wright State University's uh, campus police. Um, she was she was very torn about this. I actually spoke to her about this during the last coffee with a cop, um, and uh, she she really loves Yellow Springs, but um, she does have children who are rapidly approaching college age and that is one of the benefits that she gets for um, being an officer with mm -hmm. Wright State so mm -hmm. she couldn't pass it up. Um, the second thing is um, that um, currently we have our telephone service with um, AT&T and uh, Cincinnati Bell has actually offered us free um, upgrades of all of our telephones and some additional services and uh, for the same cost, um, essentially, that we are paying AT&T on Is a monthly basis. cell or hard No, line? it's uh, the hard lines for the offices, all of the offices, new, it's all new equipment. Um, and it's essentially, it's a lease package. So, so they maintain the equipment and the lines. Um, and so we will be switching over eventually from AT&T to Cincinnati Bell. There's, it should be seamless as far as the public is concerned, but it will be great for staff because we'll have all, right now our phones are pretty antiquated in the offices. And um, so we will have um, some new ability to transfer to remote locations, like instead of if you call Ruth Ann, and you need to talk to Brad or Jason, and they're at a remote location. She can, tra she'll be able to actually transfer you out, as opposed to saying, "Well, you have to call this other number." Is, is, is there, is it? Are we going to make sure that that citizens don't get caught in a circle of voicemails? Yes, it will be the, it'll be the same type of uh, automated assistant that we have right now, um, but. Um, It'll work just like our system now as far as from the outside. For us, in, internally, it'll be a little bit okay. simpler for us. Um, but um, the last thing is a question was um, um, brought up about the corrosive effect of the, of the water, um, the, the, the uh, new water plant and the pellet softening process. And you see that answer in, the, in, in my report. Um, the pH will be maintained um, at a slightly uh, alkaline level and it won't become acidic um, during this process. And if it should become acidic, we, we will be able to add an anti-corrosive, but we won't be adding a chemical that we don't need. Uh, so we'll just monitor that and make sure that the water does not become corrosive in the lines. But with this process, it should not do that. Um, uh, Patty, so we, yes. I think in that uh, last sentence, it, it should say if there's a decrease in the pH. Oh, yes, right? I'm sorry. You are absolutely correct, Marianne. It should say decrease. You are correct. And you know three people read that and nobody caught that. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so if we go on to the water plant process, um, you do have a couple of different handouts in your, in your packet. Um, the first one I gave to you back in December that kind of brought you up um, to, um, up to the uh, level that we were at there 
One question that Brian had asked me is that the original um, recap that I gave you noted the initial price at $8 million. Um, the $8 million was um, only for the construction of the plant itself and did not include engineering, which is why the second one that you have says $10 million. Um, that was um, because Shook had filled out their primary sheet a little bit differently, and when we started actually talking to them, we um, we realized that they had done that and hadn't included the, the engineering in that price. Well, it wasn't just engineering; it was basically all of the general conditions, which is right. all of their right. um, all of their supervision, all of their overhead, all of their profit, all of everything everything besides actually building the building plant. plant. Yeah. That added up to two million. Right, and so. Um, we started negotiations with um, Shook Construction and Jones and Henry Engineer. So we were starting at 10 million. And as you can see from my report, um, we actually got them down to uh, $7,209,233. Um, that's about as much as we're gonna be able to cut from that price. Um, once we get into the full design of it, could it conceivably go down a little bit? I would say yes, but if you shouldn't be looking for any huge gains, uh, you know, any more huge savings in that. This is not, here's what council needs to understand, this is not the guaranteed maximum price. We will not have that until June, and that's how this process works. That's how the design build process works. But um, with that said, the, the committee did meet um, and based on the funding that we have, which is a $1.3 million, 0% interest, 30-year loan from OPWC, um, and we also have a grant of $162,800 from OPWC that will pay part of the interest on the OWDA loan on the first couple of payments. Um, the rest of that would be um, borrowed from OWDA with a low interest uh, slightly below market rate loan, and I think right now that stands at 2.89. I think it was 3.2. Okay, yeah. was the full full value, um, full rate. So um, what I'm what the committee is recommending to council is that we proceed in signing a contract with Shook Construction uh, and their sub <coughs> Jones and Henry Engineering to move forward with the plant. And what I'm recommending to council is that we uh, borrow an additional $6.2 million from OWDA to finance the project. That will give us slightly more than what we need, but it will ensure that we don't have to go back to them again for <coughs> additional funding. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa because she did this lovely financial analysis for, um, eyes. for everybody to uh, understand <laughs> where the fund is going to stand I know, at the I can't end. read it. <laughs> so I apologize for the tiny print. This <laughs> is basically um, this is gleaned from uh, the RCAP report. Um, only I tailored it to be um, a little more suited towards our needs and the uh, specifics of this particular financing situation in terms of the water plant. Um, the budget that is before you um, includes the $7.5 million total cost of a water treatment plant. It also includes all of the uh, um, pieces that Patty just explained, a $1.3 million no interest 30-year loan, the $162,000 interest grant from OPWC, and then the $6.2 million loan uh, that would round out the project uh, to be uh, received from OWDA. Um, so what we basically have in front of us, um, the most important piece to kind of draw your attention to is the green block that shows our water fund balances. Um, the good, I, I was particularly nervous about this because uh, we thought that I was bracing for a payment in 2017 because as you all know, we started rate increases this year. So we won't realize full potential of those rate increases um, for a little while because we're kind of playing catch up. Um, so after Patty and I had talked with the folks at OWDA, 
the first payment would be due um, a year after substantial completion. So we figured that there would be a payment in um, 2018 and the interest uh, grant from OPWC would be taken from that first payment as well. So that actually helped us out. So the first payment would be approximately $89,000 um, in 2018. So that allows our, uh, our reserves to kind of build because of those rate increases up until that point because that would be within the third year of the 30% increase. So if you take a look at the green and you look at the bold at the bottom, which I know is kind of hard to see, by the time the first uh, payment would hit, our reserves would be at approximately 1.2 million. That's projected. So it made me much more comfortable there. Um, I had originally informed the committee that I would be um, kind of reserved to go over 7 million on a water treatment plant, but um, after kind of running these numbers and uh, the year of the first payment falling in 2018 definitely provided a cushion. I also sat down with Johnny and we looked at uh, some of the things that might need to be done. Um, in 2018, we've uh, got a Fairfield Road water line replacement project that would need to be done. We've also got the painting of the water towers in there and then uh, remote read water meters, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. if we put in a brand new water plant, we need to make sure that the water is being metered correctly um, with new meters. So uh, those are some mm -hmm. of the projects that we included, as well as transferring out approximately $50,000 every year to the capital improvement escrow fund um, to brace for any additional uh, projects that the water fund might need to take on. But having a new water treatment plant, um, two new, fairly new plants at that point, um, we anticipate that any kind of capital improvements would be minimal. So with that being said, uh, the, the long and the short of that is that I'm comfortable with moving forward from the financial standpoint, given that the kind of planet's perfectly aligned with this one in terms of the year that the payment would be hitting and the rate increases that have already been passed and uh, just kind of the 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 scenario that uh, as it's played out makes me much more comfortable so it, it has my stamp of approval at this point questions H had we guessed at what this cost was going to be before i'm not we got we, what we got an estimate from um john eastman and it was the, the first estimate was i mean it's three or four years old it's, it's maybe older than that do we know when the first estimate was and it was basically um, John got an estimate from Artesia to Pioneer to put in a package plant, and he was just repeating it. He so, you know, the estimate the estimate we got from John that we've been looking at and working with was wrong. And what was it like? Was like three and a half million. Point, well, it would be. I think it was like closer to four or four and a half million for a um, was oh, yeah, for a softening added the plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I'm not happy with, with HNTB about this, but for whatever reason, they came back and basically um, confirmed that price. They came, they came in at like $5.3 mm -hmm. for their initial budget that they put out to, um, to the contractors in the RFQ. And Sam was almost immediately getting phone calls. These contractors all looked at that plant and said, "There's no way this is a five million dollar plant." So, we, Patty was getting phone calls. Um, she got a phone call from Springfield, actually saying, "Oh, you guys are probably going to want to be going back to tying into our water because the contractors had actually been talking to somebody up there about how ex about the price of this plant." So it's. You know the estimates. We we just got bad. You know we've been we've been just looking at uh, considering way too low of an estimate of a plant mm -hmm. for what we wanted. And and you know to get a plant that um, the softening was a real issue. You know coming up with this with a softening system that is a unique system and. How does Artesia to Pioneer work? I mean, they basically just come in and it, it, set in. It's essentially what Artesian does is they do, they're literally package plants. You buy, a, a, you want to soften your water and it has iron in it. Okay, well, here's a plant that if you buy this plant, it's going to soften your water and take the iron out. Okay, here it is. Here's your square footprint. You get the same plant that everybody else gets. 
Um, it's a package plant. It's a standard plant that does exactly what you want. And these, they're designed, or you can pick elements where you, you have iron and you want to remove your iron, but you don't want to soften. Okay, here's a plant that does nothing but take iron out. Here's a plant that does nothing but take manganese out. It's, it, they're called package plants because that's exactly what they are. They're, they're packages that you buy and they build them. So it's like buying a, a prefab home kind of deal. And what would be the downsides of doing that? Um, the downside of doing that is that you're not going to find one that does the pellet softening that we want and removes the iron and manganese. So, I mean, they're just very basic plants that, that do very, very basic um, things. And then when you start adding the, the additional specialty items, that's where your cost gets driven up. So. And his, his was ion softening, mm -hmm. right. which you know, I, I wouldn't even, at this point, I wouldn't even take to the community. Well, it's, uh, ion softening, if I remember, is, is uh, slightly more to implement, but it's also more expensive to maintain. And so what's interesting to me, Melissa, is that, you know, how these numbers came out. So, I mean, is, is that because the rate study really did do a good job of capturing these costs? Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Um, what, what I had done um, for the initial discussion with the committee was it was requested that I strip down um, some of the, uh, what was perceived as, um, extra type of um, preventative and predictive maintenance because um, not everybody kind of seen eye to eye on those costs. So um, I had presented a stripped down version in the initial uh, look at what we might be able to afford. And then I, I cautioned that with I really need to sit down with Johnny to figure out uh, what kind of distribution projects he might have because even though the plants will be new and newer, um, the distribution lines will still need work. And uh, I, I wanted to talk to Johnny about a kind of plan that he was comfortable with. So we sat down and we revisited this. And really the key was allowing those reserves to be able to, to recover from um, kind of the, the hit that they had taken over the last couple of years um, before the first payment has hit so um, right. if, if the first payment would have been in 2016 I was completely against it mm -hmm. um, but as it worked out um, it, it's going to be a year after substantial completion so that that's likely going to be 2018 right. um, so that made me much more comfortable because we couldn't have afforded it and we couldn't have afforded it in 2016 we, our reserves just didn't have enough time to be able to be built up because we wouldn't have captured most of those revenues yet so mm -hmm. yeah b based on the Based on the projected construction schedule, the substantial completion of this plant should be somewhere around August of 2017. So the first payment, the payments are due um, January 1 and July 1, although Melissa tells me that they took it out in December and kind of threw her for a loop on the, on the uh, loop completion. But um, they, it would be, you know, the fact that it's not gonna be due until sometime in late 2018 is what made this work, to be honest. <coughs> because it gives us that time for those increases to be implemented and those reserves to be built up. So being a little more realistic in terms of what our expenses are gonna be, still investing in those capital improvement plans uh, to kind of compensate for taking some of those extra things out and then you know, the, the rate increases, a combination of all those things. I mean, it, it, it really was kind of the a, a perfect scenario in terms of how all this played out, even though it was a little bit more than what, you know, I was expecting, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, the question is, does council want me to bring a resolution and a contract, as well as a resolution for the OWDA loan to the next meeting? Why would we wait? Um, if we wait, it will throw us behind schedule, so. Yeah. Should go forward. Okay. Yep. I will have them at the next meeting. And I, that is it for me. Um, Melissa, I 
you've had a lot tonight. Do you have anything else additional to add mm -hmm. on your report, no. uh, Judy? Oh, I have nothing major. Nothing major. I'm just getting things done, and the stink bugs are finally starting to leave my <laughs> premises that despite and occasional <laughs> attacks. <laughs> and I, I did want to ask um, why Kathy's background check is that just that they normally take that long, or it depends on. The sheriff's department and how quick they get to them. Okay. I am it's, a little surprised it's taking yeah, this long. It's, I have to say it's really not ours. It's a it's an outside agency. So okay, yeah. So so let's go um, quickly through um, board and commission reports. Um, Judy Judith, you didn't go. To, did you go to the planning commission meeting? Because I, I know Derek. I did. They've been reviewing swimming pools mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. hot tubs. Oh boy! Oh boy! It was exciting. <laughs> and that and that one. Well, and there's <laughs> there was a piece that didn't get noticed and so couldn't get covered in that meeting. So following the next planning commission meeting, there should be a wave of legislation <laughs> or just ordinances, I believe. Um, I actually just had a Green County Regional Planning meeting tonight um, or this afternoon. It's the executive committee. They've asked me to be on the executive committee mm -hmm. um, so we kind of make initial decisions and interestingly enough the the um, the uh, projects they're hearing was down in Spring Valley and it's related to a mine or a gravel pit actually being dug under part of their over over part of their well field I mean it was oh. pretty interesting we it was absolutely unanimous now we don't make decisions it's just a recommending body absolutely unanimous that um, they not be allowed to do that now it goes to the full board then it goes to their planning commission then it goes to their trustees mm. so hopefully everybody will but it was pretty interesting to hmm. be sitting there listening to that so apropos to that uh, one thing when um, we met with Tecumseh Land Trust to, well, we were actually talking about the glass farm thing but um, Krista pointed out that we do not have an easement over our well fields. We own that land, but we don't have a conservation easement. Hmm. Interesting. So that's something that good for us to do. Uh, Brian? Um, okay, so let me start with uh, the Public Art Commission, because that's pretty quick. Um, lots of progress being made on uh, policies to get the John Bryan Community Gallery uh, back in action, which I think is really good. And you'll notice um, the uh, Arts, uh, Arts and Culture Commission did uh, sort of confirm what they thought would be good goals for 2016. Any feedback from council would be appreciated. Um, also, uh, I think the, the, the piece about funding for public art is very interesting. And they want to look at what kinds of grants and things the village might qualify for and actually looking for maybe another person on the commission that has that background. Um, and then I'll mention one more time, still taking uh, nominations for the Village Inspiration and Design Award until March 1st. Um, the Community Access Panel, I think it's very interesting to look at Susan's report. One thing that I was really frustrated by is the station went down for over a week because of Time Warner. And I guess there's nothing we can do about that, but you know, we invested in a new server, which we can send back, but it, it brought to light another issue, which is being discussed by the panel now is, should we just shift to an online station? Um, and so that's being discussed. I just wanted to give council a heads up. Uh, Susan's on board with this. I think there's a lot of interesting potential and, and even our folks that use it as a lifeline could still I think get on a computer but you know we'll, we'll see where that comes but you know very frustrating that that happened I also um, wanted to give Susan kudos for um, the tribute to Faith Patterson mm -hmm. on the station thanks for doing that that was great mm -hmm. um, and I will emphasize that community access panel really needs members we are close to the point where we may not be able to have a quorum moving forward um, so I encourage people to think about the value of community access and, and the many things that we're working on. 
um, but that has been a commission that's been undersubscribed. Uh, community access panel also has its 2016 goals. Um, you will notice that the municipal broadband piece is not on that. I explained before there, there's really not a role for the panel at this point, and I think it resolves some other things. Um, and then Economic Sustainability Commission will be confirming their goals, uh, but they'll be in line with council goals. I think we've sort of laid out what the commission sh should be working on and everybody's on board with that. Great group. I mean, we now have a very diverse uh, group in so many different ways, I'm excited. Um, and you know, the, the focuses right now are the revolving loan fund and the incentive policy. Marianne, or Judith, excuse me. Um, the Energy Board um, is reviewing uh, proposals for the solar uh, uh, farm, or whatever we call it there, over on uh, the glass farm, and should be bringing something back to council the next meeting. Um, and there's going to be a special meeting uh, next week, which is an executive session meeting primarily, to re again, to be looking over those proposals. Uh, the Library Commission, um, they're looking at a lot of just small issues of the building. Um, they, I was impressed with the detail with which they are caring for our, for our building and, and, and uh, overseeing things. Um, and I know uh, Patty had sent uh, some information over which I shared with them, which they were uh, glad to know that. And so they're going to, they're thinking, you know, the library has gotten a lot of funding to help the physical plant in the last couple of years anyway. And um, so that, that they'll be just focusing and now it's little small things just to keep the upkeep uh, mm -hmm. of the building in good shape. Okay, um, Miriam? H, uh, okay, the mediation program uh, has not met since I've been the liaison, but we mediation has a meeting scheduled for the 10th of March. Um, and one of the things that we're going to talk about and uh, talk with the chief, I haven't talked to you about this, I don't think, but about the um, community police mediation concept. I think, I think maybe you might have gone to a, did you go to a meeting, the no. mediation committee meeting? No, but chief and I talked about that when, when you and I talked about uh, it previously and chief, then chief and I talked about I it. I think, okay. well, at, at any rate, Janet and Mueller is going to come to yeah. the mediation program to talk about mm -hmm. how that works. Um, so the, uh, I haven't done anything yet with the school board, but I, I will be making contact with them. Uh, the Environmental Commission just met tonight. Uh, we're starting to work out plans for the Clean Ohio grant, uh, including the Beaver Management Task Force, which Vicki is going to get in touch with Patty about. But that was a topic of discussion at the meeting, how that, the idea that there would be a group that include, included stakeholders like neighbors, as well as a village staff person, council person, EC person, to be ongoingly monitoring beaver activities. Mm -hmm. um, we talked uh, about educational activities. One, we're going to start doing uh, a series of educational activities starting in June, mostly around water, because uh, between the glass farm wetlands and the wellhead protection work, a lot of the work that HR uh, that. Uh, EC is doing involves water. Um, that's mostly what we talk about at HRC. I mean, at, at EC. Okay. Oh, um, we have someone who'd like to become a member of mm -hmm. the Environmental Commission. You got a short letter. George Coder is his name. Uh, George had been living in Cleveland, recently moved here. He spent most of his career after he had been a history professor at Ohio State, but he spent most of his career working for the U.S. EPA in public relations. Hmm. And um, he's very interested in uh, sustainability and wants to help uh, the Environmental Commission with educational outreach. So, but he does have some health concerns. So what he, so what we suggested 
we being um, Jerry Sims and myself who interviewed him was that he uh, come on as an alternate and he felt good about that because then he didn't feel quite the sort of pressure mm -hmm. uh, of being a regular member so Jerry and I had a good interview with George and um, we're excited about having him come on the Do you want to make a motion? Environmental Commission, so we would like to, I, w I would like to move that uh, council uh, accept the nomination of uh, George for the Environmental Commission as an alternate. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Pretty invaluable yeah. resource. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so HRC. Um, mm -hmm. One of the topics of the last meeting was uh, planning for the HRC retreat, which is going to be on the 6th, Sunday the 6th, uh, in room A and B from 1.30 to 4.30. And uh, we started developing a list of things, that w topics that we wanted to have at the retreat. Uh, we also did talk about the concept of the yellowspringshelp.org and I'm really not sure where that's going to go but you know, I, hopefully it'll go somewhere. Uh, we also talked about the community drug issues meeting that we had and the report that came out of that and um, we're, three of us are going to get together to decide what next steps we as HRC would take in, in uh, whether facilitating any more discussions or what happens. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But some good things did come out of that meeting, I think, so at least we would try to move some of those ideas forward. So I think that takes care of HRC. Okay. Well done. Um, I said the chamber has their, we have our annual meeting Thursday night. Um, let's see what else. Um, it's obviously this is our quiet time except for getting getting ready for um, the annual meeting and then we're um, still we're really busy just starting getting busy on street fair so that things are moving forward there and VRPC I had the minutes from the last meeting um, in the packet and it does appear that things are going to be moving forward with this kind of modified 35 um, route 35 access plan that's going to cost you know a few million dollars compared to a hundred million so mm. um, it, something absolutely needs to happen there because it is dangerous and there are a lot of backups so hopefully this will be a resolution um, let's look ahead um, briefly at the future agenda items this is what we have um, the only I, I do have quite the flat rate structure discussion we're going to have uh, you know I know that I want to get to, to kind of inform some businesses of what's going on and I don't feel I have enough information to even talk to them. We're, we're going to work on some additional flat rate information. Mm -hmm. It will with, uh, with John Courtney, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but so it's, I should probably just put out an invitation for business owners potentially to come to that meeting to learn about it or um, what? Yes, and we can have a meeting. Once Melissa has a chance to get with John, she can schedule a meeting and, and we can let you know okay. when that is. Okay. Um, so, I don't know, did we, I don't think, oh, goals, we still have to approve goals, so mm -hmm. we'll add approve goals. And then you'll have the two pieces of legislation for the contract with Shook and the OWDA resolution. That's totally already on there, isn't it? The OWDA uh, is yeah. on there. Yeah, that one's mm -hmm. on there. Yeah. And you are, the energy board will be ready with the solar array? It should yes. be. Yeah. Yep. And there, but they will definitely have their annual report as well planning, okay? March 21st, um, see what's on there. Just again, if you're, um, if one of your commissions is scheduled, I'm sure you're aware of that, so. Okay, um, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. Can I just, oh, excuse me. Well, we don't have to pick dates yet, but I, I want to make sure that that work session on the municipal broadband. I thought we decided the, we were going to talk about it at the retreat. But oh, is we've got to get the goals. Before we, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. And then I also, 
you know, I know we've talked about it before, but maybe it's t it, it would be good to talk about it again with the treasurer's report and why we lose money. I mean, and so, you know, Melissa, so it, can you answer that? I mean, it doesn't have to be right now, but you know, either Rachel or. What do you just mean? Like why to, we lose money? So you know, this in 2015 we lost we lost 141 thousand, and uh, that actually the fund balance went down. The investments actually lost. I'd have to look at the. Well, it probably account. has to do with the balance of fees that we're paying. Yeah, I'd have to. I honestly don't know how right. how she puts that together. So I'd have to. I'd have to look at it. She look, she takes it straight from the bank statements, and I mean our. Our money is, you know, spread into a couple sure. of different places. So I'd have to, I'd have to look at it right. and I understand from a fund, you right. know, from a fund perspective to understand that. Okay, because I know, you know, we we've, we've been told about the limits and you know, in terms of what municipalities can fund, but I don't know. It just kills me that you know we've got millions in the bank and we're making very little interest or losing right. money, and. I just want to make sure that we're. Do we want? Do we want to ask Rachel to come to either the March seventh or the March twenty first meeting? I would say the March twenty first. Just looking at the. Do we want to? We've been discussing this for years. I know. So do you I don't understand it either. I know. It I, I mean, I hear yeah, things are supposed to change and whatever. I don't know. It'd just be nice to know what the prospects are. You know. Judy. I think we're losing less than we were. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I mean. That's yes, true. Judy. <laughs> yeah, the twenty first. Um, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of litigation with our solicitor present. I so move. Second. Winter. Yes. House. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Templin. Yes. 